Hear ye, hear ye, prepare thyself for a proclamation from the Dukes of Gaming. Do you love video games? Do you love staying up to date with the latest going ons of the gaming industry? Do you love shooting the breeze with your friends about all things interactive entertainment? Well then fine people, do we have a podcast just for you. Join us at the Dukes of Gaming podcast. Gather around as me and my fellow Dukes bring you the most interesting news, interesting topics, and spicy hot takes from the video game realm every single Monday. If that sounds like a blast to you, subscribe to Dukes of Gaming, no questions asked. Available wherever you get your podcast. Hear ye, hear ye, the ad read is over. Welcome to the License to Watch 100th Episode Spectacular. We are back, baby. It's a new year, and we're starting it off right with a new movie franchise. First up is my personal selection, the first Matt's choice of 2022. That is, of course, the Rocky film franchise. Beginning with the one that started it all, 1976's Academy Award for Best Picture winner, Rocky. Directed by John G. Alvidson and starring a then-unknown Sylvester Stallone, who also wrote the script, this movie went on to widespread financial and critical acclaim. Stallone, a small-time actor at the time, was inspired by the famous fight between Muhammad Ali and Chuck Wepner, in which Wepner, who was highly expected to lose to the great Muhammad Ali, lasted 15 rounds against the champ. Stallone claims that after seeing this fight, he was motivated to write a boxing underdog story, and according to him, he allegedly wrote the script for Rocky in just three days. United Artists saw the script as a vehicle for a big-time actor of the time, like Robert Redford, Burt Reynolds, or James Caan. But Sly's agents pushed for him to star, knowing that the producers could greenlight the movie if the budget was kept low enough. Sure enough, the movie was greenlit with the Italian stallion himself in the starring role as Rocky Balboa, the pugilist with a heart of gold. The movie went on to win Best Picture at the Golden Globes that year, as well as Best Editing, Best Director, and Best Picture at the Academy Awards, taking in a total of $225 million at the box office off of only a $1 million budget. It was the highest grossing movie of 1976 and the second highest grossing movie of 1977 behind only Star Wars. It launched the career of Sylvester Stallone, who went on to portray Rocky Balboa seven more times after this. So we'll be dissecting the direct sequels to this movie, which include Rocky 2, 3, 4, 5, and ending with Rocky Balboa. Joining us for this very special 100th episode is a long-time mentioned but first-time guest, who also happens to be my wife. That's right, Colleen McGregor is here to drop some Rocky knowledge on Colin, Harris, and me. Thank you, long-time listeners, and thank you, first-time listeners. We couldn't have gotten to our 100th episode without you. So without further ado, let's begin our exploration of the Rocky franchise of films right now, starting with the 1976 Academy Award-winning John G. Alvidson boxing classic, Rocky. This is a show about franchises, underdog movie franchises, and you're listening to License to Watch. Why in the world was this movie made? switch the metals that the metals are made of you know do you think gold will ever be like platinum else? they'll they'll have a better than gold yeah like so. le- hypothetically let's say like a meteorite hits the earth and it like drops off a few new precious metals that we didn't have before and like it also lands within the domain of the olympic committee and um so they start using <laughs> The, the so, meteorite wait, metals. So, so you think that it's like <laughs> that the reason that gold is the number one is because it's like the rarest and most valuable. But if something was even rarer and more valuable, miraculously, they'd be like, oh, well, shit, who wants a gold now, right? Well, yeah. here's a better question. Like in the Marvel world, do you think like gold is second to like vibranium? Like, is oh, that, of course. Yeah. Like yeah. The yeah. Marvel Olympics, <laughs> you can get a vibranium medal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, see, this is a good this is a good idea for a, a, a Marvel story is like. You know, one of the villains, like, secretly sneaks in the vibranium when he, like, 
you know, mixed it with the gold and his fake gold medal or something or her or whatever, you know, you, you lost me there. It's like um, a I sneaky, do, I don't know. I think something. when I we're going to need this new medal is when somebody actually gets better than a 10, like in gymnastics or something. And, and they, they score an 11. Yeah. Overall. Then it's like, oh, well, that's when they bring just, in the unobtainium. Yeah. You know, <laughs> we can't just give them a gold. <laughs> They've got, and they, they're on like a special platform that's mm. actually separate from the three podiums. There's like right. a separate one. This is a really tall rectangle <laughs> that they stand on. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and then man. also pieces uh, of the aggro crag, of course. Need yeah. To be, uh, people sell that yeah. shit on, on eBay. Yeah. Like people who want an aggro crag rock. You know, do you remember from Guts? Do you remember that show on Nickelodeon? Yeah. Global Guts. You won, like, you had to climb the aggro crag. That was, like, the big, like, uh, you know, final achievement you had to unlock. Conquer the crag, if you will. Yeah. And if you won it, you your trophy was basically, like, a piece of it. But it was a big, like, foam, like, you know, they spray painted it to look like a rock, basically. And so now people as adults who, like, were on the show are selling it on eBay for, like, 300 bucks or something. And, um, and kind of, um, I understand this because I never watched that show. I have no attachment to it whatsoever. But when you say there's like a, I could get a trophy, an Agricrag trophy for 300 bucks. I'm like, sometimes I've had 300 bucks to burn. And, you know, I definitely would think about it. I mean, as like a mantelpiece or yeah. something, it's definitely yeah, totally. a good talking yeah. point. Like, <laughs> whoa, you were on guts. You could just lie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was pre-internet. So there's no video of it, but I was definitely on, man. <laughs> How else would I get this aggro crack? eBay? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay. What's that eBay receipt right next to it? Never mind that. <laughs> this would be a good Law & Order episode. It's like the victim has blunt force trauma. It's in this exact shape. We can't find what the shape is. <laughs> oh, looks like it's a piece of the aggro crack. <laughs> Let's go to Mo. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go to Mo. <laughs> She's a little ref shirt. <laughs> She's like, crikey, it looks like there was a murder here. <laughs> I don't even remember. She, she was Australian. Australian. No, she was Scottish. <laughs> Blimey. Blimey. <laughs> oh, God. Guys, it's good to be back. It's 2022. There, we were on a bit of a break there, and now we are back, and we're talking Rocky, the first of many, many movies. 5,000, I believe. Yeah. Rocky 5,000. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think I'm, I'm excited. This is a good, uh, you know, underdog story. This is a good, uh, it's a good series with a lot of ups and downs. I'm excited to get into it. Correct uh, me if I'm wrong. This is also a license to watch first in that we have never covered a movie that won an Oscar before, have we? I, you know, I thought about that too. It's a best picture winner. That yep. doesn't surprise me. I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, we've covered Oscar winners because, you know, a lot of these movies have won like Alien. Won for she some, was nominated. You know, yeah, for, yeah, there's yeah, definitely acting. nominations for acting and there's definitely some effects awards and stuff like that. But this one was like the big, this one at all. So yeah, I definitely want to get into the history of this movie and all that. But before we do, uh, we should introduce our special guest because guys, not only is this a first, uh, is that a first, but this is also our very special 100th episode We've been doing this for so long. Uh, we are old men now, and this is <laughs> we've done it a hundred times. I can't believe it. I mean, this counting our James Bond stuff. This is the one hundredth uh, uh, movie, or I don't know if it's the one hundredth movie because we count like mini episodes and things like that. Yeah. But this is our one hundredth official episode. Congratulations, we did it, guys. We did it, it and we did it in only what in four 10, years? years. It feels <laughs> yeah. like a lot longer. Yeah. It feels like we've been it's doing almost this five years now. For I think. most of my life. Uh, but anyway, our very special guest, you know, I thought it's a special episode. We need to have a really special guest. And so it's someone we uh, that I've mentioned on the show many a time. And, uh, you know, I, she's a she's a writer, a producer, director. Um, she's a very sexy lady. Uh, this is uh, hello. <laughs> hello. This is my wife, <laughs> Colleen <laughs> McGregor. What's up? Thank you for doing this. Thank you for uh, coming all this way to do this show. <laughs> it's been a ride. <laughs> yeah. hundred episodes. I mean, in. I think we got married, divorced, and married again <laughs> since you guys have done this podcast. How wow. many episodes? How many of those episodes have you actually heard? I'm going to be honest with you. Oh no! And I've heard about half of one. It's true. <laughs> I can vouch for that. Not familiar with our work. <laughs> um, it's, it's I would okay. S- I would say her history uh, of this podcast is much of ire, much of <laughs> uh, <laughs> much of grief, yeah, much of uh, yeah. <laughs> Disdain. It's kind of our thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's what's holding the marriage together. It's, it's a thing we do. Yeah. 
I give him shit about it. You don't need to know. You don't need to be familiar with the podcast to be a guest on the podcast. In fact, I think most of our guests aren't. So that's true. That works great. (laughs) I feel like I'm very intimate with the podcast because I see all the movies in the background. (laughs) <laughs> and, I, and I disagree with most of the choices of movies that are picked. <laughs> and yeah, Matt tells me about every movie because I won't watch it. So you then are I have forced to, to watch some of them, I'm right? for, forced to hear the recap from Matt okay. about each movie and all the history. It's necessary. But have Have you been trying to influence Matt's opinions and uh, what he's been saying about these movies? Matt is impenetrable. You cannot sway Matt's opinions. Mm. No matter what I tell him. <laughs> so, no, I don't have any effect on that. But it's true. I do try to, like, give my strong opinions about some of the franchises. And Colleen's good at dipping in for a movie for, like, five minutes and then giving her opinion of the entire movie based on that five-minute segment that she watched. <laughs> <laughs> and, is, and is she usually pretty spot on with that? Or? No, she's <laughs> always dead wrong. Uh, a case in point, I, I was going to bring this up later, but we might as well get into it now. Um Star Trek for the, what's it called? The Voyage Home. The Voyage Home. Uh, yeah, I was like loving it. It was the end of the movie. They were wrapping up and Colleen comes in and watches five minutes and she's like, how can you watch this utter trash? And I was like, woman, get out. Get out of this room. I feel like that was one of the good ones because I was not a big Star Trek fan, but there were a couple that were really good. Wrath of Khan was great and The Voyage Home, I think, was another yeah. really good one. Wow. Yeah. Um, there, were, there were some of them that were surprisingly, Voyage like, I Home. was like, oh my God. I saw, like, Speaking of Oscar nominees, it was the one that was nominated for Best Cinematography and she remarked uh, on how bad it looked. I, I didn't even know that and I was like, this cinematography is so terrible. It's not cinematic at all. And I just felt like that was actually when we got divorced because <laughs> I said to him, this is a deal breaker. If you really truly believe that this is a good movie, <laughs> after I can't all the be great films, to somebody I don't respect, <laughs> <laughs> and all the great films that exist, if you're just, I felt like I'm like it's fine if you're doing it as a bit for the podcast, to kind of like, or you're fanboying and you just love it. But if this is really truly how you feel, then it's over. <laughs> I feel like Colin's got something. He's looking something up. I I sent you guys a meme about uh, Star Trek for recently and memes I just don't do, memes don't translate well on podcasts wait i said like you mean the one i sent you guys but the with the weed smoking the marijuana let's all compare star trek <sighs> i memes. think so I yeah it's right it here though. it's right here it's like it's sho- it <laughs> shows important. a picture of like a blunt <laughs> and it's it's marking off that the the, the front end oh of the yeah blunt, yes, yes yes the front end of the blunt like i would say a good like yeah, like three quarters. Um, three quarters of the way yeah. down. It's it's labeled as fuck off. They're not going back in time to find a fucking whale. And then the very end of the blunt, like when you're super high, like the very end, it says, I take it back. This is the best movie I've ever seen in my life. Yes. <laughs> very accurate. Imagine being in the theater the first time and you realize like the whole movie is about them going back in time to, like, to save a whale. Get some whale. <laughs> get some whale. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, that movie. Sometimes movies can be so dumb that they're kind of smart again. They, yeah. they go all so all the way around and, and make it work. Yeah. This this movie that we're talking about today is actually a pretty smart movie. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, who, did you do any research on this? Um, not a ton, but a little. Yeah. I mean, let's talk about kind of like uh, how this movie came to be and Sylvester Stallone. So, so I did not do research, but I like always love this movie and I there's things I knew about it um going in so maybe I'll paraphrase that and you guys can correct whatever's wrong that sure. sounds like a fun game <laughs> okay I think this was a script that Stallone wrote himself and tried to shop around and people did not want to invest in it and he ended up having to basically make it himself something You're like off to that a bad start no not, no, not exactly not, not not really very uh accurate. it's the script is based on an actual fight between Muhammad Ali and this like Italian guy. Nope, not an Italian. You're doing you're doing really poorly. <laughs> Polish so far. guy. Something you like might that? have a Polish. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Chuck like Wepner, who has yeah. one of the best nicknames. Um, he was called the Bayonne Bleeder. Right. Just yeah, because yeah. he would just get pounded and just start bleeding all over everyone. And that um, this is like he was. Sylvester Stallone was relatively uh, unknown before. He was an actor. He was in a couple of things. I know he was in like a Woody Allen movie or two. Okay. Where he's playing like a rough and tumble kind of like gangsterish guy for like one scene. Yeah, you he know? sort of played okay. like he played like background tough guys. Goons. And yeah, goons. He was in a, a, a Robert Mitchum 
uh, remake of Farewell, My Lovely, the Raymond Chandler novel, um, as like a g- random goon. Um, and, and he was in Lords of Flatbush. He had a pretty big role in that, which was sort of like a bunch of Brooklyn tough guys in the 60s. Okay. okay. Um, but, you know, his career was not where he wanted it to be. And he'd been he'd been at it for let's see when did this come out this is seventy six so he'd been at it for well he'd only been really working I think for less than ten years but he was hitting thirty past his you know past like that prime hot young actor phase he probably had a lot of actor friends whose careers had taken, taken off, off. Uh, to some extent and you know he said that he had would one of the reasons he wrote the script was he didn't think anybody would want to read a script about a washed up down and out actor trying to make it big but that's the story that he wanted to tell because that's the story that he was living so if you just pretend like all the boxing shit is actually him trying to be an actor then this kind of makes more sense is that's what he was trying to do but he, he found the vehicle in it in this you know sort of guy who was feeling it at 30 like he was already past his prime and everyone else was already moving forward so how did he get people to invest in this he didn't um he got people to buy it and um uh it, part of that was him being a star uh it was actually produced by a couple of you know fairly well-known Erwin Winkler and Robert Chardoff who I can't remember what they did but they'd done other things and John G. Avildsen was a you know a well-known commodity as a director what did he direct before this uh let's look that up um I mean he's best known for Karate Kid which he did after this oh. and this of course um he did a movie called Joe he did a movie called Save the Tiger um which was a dr- he's mostly d- did like dramas Save the Tiger was about Jack Lemmon played an alcoholic so that's what he, he was doing like sort of and it's funny because this movie sort of feels like one of those gritty 70s dramas in a lot of ways mm-hmm. and it's funny to think that it became such a iconic sports franchise of the 80s of the 80s yeah. Yeah. but but it when it was in the 70s it was a gritty you know, working class drama with very little boxing in it, shockingly. Well, this, he has two franchises like that. Rambo is like the first movie exactly. is its own thing, and then the sequels yeah. are in the 80s, and there's something else. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, this is a prime example of the first movie being very different than, or, or not necessarily giving indication of the direction that the sequels would take. Right. Yeah, I mean, I was, I had seen it when I was a kid. Um, my parents owned a copy that they had, uh, ripped off, of, or you know, you videotaped off TV, you put your cassette tape in. No, yeah, cut this out. What do you? Do? What taping off a of TV? Yeah, taping off a of TV. So we yeah. had it, and it, we had Rocky One, Rocky Two, II, Rocky Three. It was all on our shelf. So I remember seeing this, but when I watched it again, I have to say that I was blown away, pleasantly surprised. I thought the direction on this film was top notch. Like one of the, like what he did with this film, I thought was almost perfect. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we're seeing something that people always forget when they talk about Rocky is that he was a mob enforcer and um, yeah, he was a loan shark thumb breaker. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> he's like of, the nicest thumb breaker you yeah. ever want to meet. True, <laughs> and this True. is part of the brilliance of this because I think the script for this it, that Stallone wrote apparently in three days after watching the Wepner Ali match, um, he wrote the first draft in three days, and of course it went through a lot more work. But it's a really impressive, like, they look at how well they set up this character of Rocky, where he's, they open with him in the ring getting his ass kicked. He comes back and wins that fight, but it's pretty clear that he's not a good boxer. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you just see him walking home. He knows everybody in the neighborhood. He's helping people out. You know, he's sort of going out of his way to help people. Then you see his job is to break this guy's thumbs, and he doesn't do it. He lets the guy off, and his boss yells at him. But even his boss, this scary loan shark who's pissed that he didn't do what he was told and break this guy's thumbs is still like nice to him. It's like, ah, he's a good guy. He's just kind of dumb. And you know, he's a loser, you know, yeah, his boss is not that scary. (laughs) He's like very nice to him later. Yeah, I think, yeah, one of the best scenes that portrayed that was the neighborhood girl. He walks home to give advice Mm -hmm. and she's just like, yeah, (laughs) yeah. He's trying to, he's trying to straighten her out and help her, but he's a loser and and, and she's not listening to him. No, it was really sad. What's uh, funny is, do you do you yeah. know that speaking to that little girl in that scene, this we're getting way ahead of ourselves. But in a movie called Rocky Balboa, that is a one of the further down the road sequels to this, the woman from the old neighborhood that he meets and starts a relationship with after, um, you know, what's her name is dead after uh, uh, Adrian. Adrian is what? dead. Okay. Uh, is She's Marie dead? <laughs> well, in in one of the many farther down sequels, oh, Rocky Six, like, when he's old. 
It's uh, called Rocky Six. Wait, but that well, actress the, is the same actress? It's not the same actress. No. But it's supposed but, to be the same character? I think it's supposed to be the same character because she introduced herself as, oh, I'm Marie. You remember I was one of the little kids from the neighborhood when you were... Crazy. And he ends up dating her in Rocky mm-hmm. Bell? Well, I've seen that movie too and I totally forget. Yeah. Uh, is the Lone Shark guy, is that is that guy also in The Godfather? Is yes, he, like he is. Chi in The Godfather? He is in The Godfather. He's in a bunch of Scorsese movies. He's yeah. the, the, I think he's a dispatcher and taxi driver. Um, he's also in a movie called, he's the main character in a like cult classic horror film called Maniac where he plays like a serial killer. Oh, yeah. Uh, Joe Spinell. Spin- yeah, Joe Spinell, I think is his name. Mm-hmm. I like his uh, mannerisms. He's very... Uh, very Talks flamboyant. Yeah. yeah, he's got a good look too. Yeah. He's got a very distinct look, and the inhaler here in this scene where he just randomly pulls out an inhaler in the middle. Of it. <laughs> he's like yelling at Rocky. He's got to take a break to use his inhaler. I love this movie. It uses the train moving in the background a lot. Like they just went to a location that had a train, and we're like, okay, train's coming. Let's 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 roll. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's just like production value. You know, yeah. uh, I love how dumpy everything looks. Like. I really miss the grittiness of movies like this, like from the 70s. I, I feel like the America in the 1970s was shit. It was just falling <laughs> apart. Um, but but you, you, you want to see more of it. I that. do. I, yeah. like, I like the grittiness. I like the shittiness. Yeah. Uh, I feel like movies today, and I've said this probably before, like are so too glossy and like everything just looks... Like if they were to make remake this movie, for instance, and have it set in the same time period, like the clothes he's wearing right there would like, you know, here they look a little beat up. He's been wearing them forever. But like... In a movie today, they would be pristine looking and like, I don't know. Even when they make things look shitty, they it looks like fake shitty to me. You know what I'm saying? And part of this is that the, this movie was, because Stallone was attached, the only way, like I think it was, I can't remember who was really interested in it. Maybe Paramount originally wanted to do it, but they wanted to do it as a big budget thing with like Paul Newman or some, you know, like John uh, Burt Boyd, Reynolds. I think. Uh, yeah, there was a lot of different names that they were throwing around that were like James Caan. They wanted a real big actor to do it, and Stallone wouldn't sell it unless he was attached to Star, and he just refused. Um, so they ended up having to make it for a million dollars, which at, even at this stage was not not a lot of money. Oh, that's and where I got the impression that yeah. it is kind of yeah. It, it turned out even though it was backed by you know pretty big players, it was the it was, they were actually hedging their bets against a Scorsese movie called New York, New York, which flopped and went way over budget, and they kind of knew that they were uh, getting screwed by the, by where that was going. I believe that one became a casino. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> but. <laughs> <laughs> pretty, I get that, and yeah. we're we're back, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think they were they were basically hedging their bets by like spending too much money on this movie that looked like it might be a flop, but they could spend no money on this movie that had a really great script. I mean, so many things about this movie make it. The music is great. The music is like such a big part of this movie for me. Um, yeah, he's so endearing. He's just like. He's a good actor. He's and he's and this is rem- a reminder of how good he can be in the right roles. He's, he's been good in several things, but he's. Great I think he's incredible. I don't know if this is like I know a lot of it's him and how he actually is, but uh, he's so good. I, I think a lot of people, you know, seeing him for the first time, were like, "Wow, he can really like play a character like this really well." And then they saw him in Rocky too and the rest, and they were like, "Oh, that's just how he talks." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting because he actually is, you know, obviously he wrote this great script. He's known as one of the smarter guys. And, you know, it's funny that like... He's business savvy. Yeah, yeah. he's... he's And it's funny that him and Arnold Schwarzenegger and um, Dolph Lundgren are all like, have a lot of really intellectual accomplishments that are pretty impressive. <laughs> like, they're all very savvy, intelligent people, but they play these dumb bruisers and these, like, <laughs> yeah. meatheads in all these movies. And it's just kind of ironic that some of the biggest muscle man stars were actually really bright guys. But he's he's super intelligent, but he does such a great job of conveying this, like, guy who's kind of like, he's dumb, but in a very specific way, you know? Like, he's not he's not like emotionally dumb. Right. He's not, like, there's s- stuff that he's very smart about, this character, um, but he's also really clearly not very bright in many really important well, practical as ways. As the series goes on, they will criminally downplay his brain damage. But, what? <laughs> 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 but, yes. but what's great about this movie, too, is like it's not so much that he's dumb because you do get that he is very smart and emotionally smart. You know, like the thing is that he like, I don't know, he's like self-sabotaging or something like he hates himself or he hates that like. I don't know what it is. You know, like he's more like it's not that he's dumb. It's that he's like upset with himself that he's like made bad choices or something. Like, do you guys get what I'm saying? Like, yeah, it's frustrated. It's almost like he feels like he's he's 
he is a loser and he can't escape being a loser. When he gets offered the Creed fight, I forgot that his initial reaction to getting offered the Creed fight is to be like, oh, I wouldn't be a very good fight. He'd, he'd take me apart. Uh, no thanks. You know, it's yeah. like, you know, like he gets the lifetime, oppor- the once in a lifetime opportunity. His first reaction is, oh, I'm not the right guy. You know? Right. Right. Yeah, um, and I think that's kind of what it and this is. What Mick is telling him when he says why he doesn't want to train him later on, he says, "You got all the heart in the world, and you could have been t- and you could have been talented, and you just didn't want it. You didn't put in the work. You wasted it. You're a, a knuckle breaker for a gangster. You know, like yeah, you're you're wasting your talent. That's kind of like his situation is that he just doesn't think he's actually good enough. Does do you think that mirrors his uh? relationship with uh adrian in this movie where she also does not recognize her own uh uh, talents and abilities and he's trying to pull that out of her yes 100 percent. well i think i think they try to start in the beginning with the self-reflective photo of himself as a child and then it kind of pans over to what we think you know i guess are his parents and it's pretty clear he doesn't have a family so he's really like a neighborhood is sort of his family but it's really a backdrop to this sort of lonely guy and so I think, in a way, his lack of success is that no one's really took him in as a true family, you know. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what this movie is about: is is opening yourself up to to love. And it is, it is at at its heart, it's a love story. It really is about the relation. Because at the end of the movie, our last moment isn't the victory or success in the ring; it's Adrian. You know right. that he's he goes through this entire thing, and he realizes that the most important thing for him is her. And it's a really cute. You know, like spoilers, Harris. It's a really nice (laughs) story, but but I think one and I think to that point, the most important thing for them to convey early on is a he's a nice guy and we like him and we want him to succeed. But more importantly, I think they did such a great job of conveying his loneliness in so many ways. Where he goes home and he talks to his fucking turtles and he has a conversation with himself in the mirror about turtle food, (laughs) and you're like, oh my god, this guy's got no one, and he's trying to he's trying to like in this shy, awkward way hit on this pet shop girl who's actually too shy to even talk to him uh, i she's so shy that it's like does she have some kind of problem <laughs> right like, well this, and i think <laughs> even her brother feels that way like yeah. you know he's uh, he even says like he calls her stupid or something uh, yeah and and the guy what about the uh, the loan sharks driver who's like says that she's a uh, an r word oh yeah, <laughs> yeah yeah that's right and you should take her to the zoo um, but it's, you know, like apparently people did think she had like something real wrong with her because she was so shy. But then, you know, in Rocky two, she's like, not like that at all. Well, even at the end <laughs> of this movie, she kind of blossoms yeah. into like, that's like one of the nice kind of, you know, swan stories here is that like, she kind of, she gets, she gets into a relationship, gets out from under her brother's control and kind of finds herself and, like, decides to, like, dress up a little bit. You know? Yeah, she even says at one point, like, when he says to her, he makes her take her glasses off and her hat, and he's like, you're you're beautiful. And she's like, do you mean that? You know, like, it, you, you get the sense that she's never been told that by anyone, you know? And, like, that's why she is the way she is, is because she's under the thumb of her brother, who, like, is a piece of shit. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, and that's probably, that's probably really what Sylvester Stallone kind of felt about himself. It's like, I'm a diamond in the rough. I just don't have the right... Yeah. I don't have the right support. I don't have the right people, the right family, the right people. But underneath it all, I am this beautiful person. I'm this beautiful actor. I have good ideas. And that's sort of reflected in Adrian. But I think, yeah, some of these, some of this is really about someone seeing you for what you are and that maybe your circumstances can really push you down. Mm-hmm. And being in it with a you know a brother who's abusive or him having kind of been orphaned, it seems, might have stilted some of his potential. Yep. Yeah, it's definitely about like, you know, recognizing your own value and and finding like you said finding the family that that also recognizes that um and it's you know and that's sort of the relationship with i was amazed at how um sort of under underplayed the role between rocky and mickey is in this movie because it grows into something bigger um in the next two films but they really don't have a lot of scenes together, and their biggest scene is basically Rocky telling him to fuck off when Mickey, who's been shitting on him nonstop, f- finds out he's got this big fight and comes sucking up trying to get a piece of it, and Rocky tells him very rightly, like, where were you last week? Where you, were you 10 years ago? I needed you all those times, and you weren't around. And it's a good point. And, and I love the Burgess-Meredith reaction in that scene, the, the, you know, that it's like he's like, yeah, he, he's got me. You know, like, I yeah. don't deserve this. 
But then I'll, he, I'll show myself out. But then he <laughs> runs after him and he shakes his hand and so basically saying like, "All right, I'll I'll take you in, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like you can be my manager or whatever." Because that is still his dream, you know. Like this, yeah. is, this yeah. is what he's wanted for ten years, and just because he was too proud to, to to say yes right away doesn't mean he's going to throw it away right. altogether. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I was sorry. I was surprised also. Like I was kind of waiting for the. You know, putting the band together sort of scenes mm-hmm. of like Mickey Training and then Polly, and, yeah. <laughs> and I was surprised that yeah, in both of them he was basically like fuck off to Mickey yeah. and to Polly. You know, <laughs> Polly's like kind of a drunken asshole in this. You know, oh, he's yeah. a total mooch throughout, but he becomes more <laughs> lovable and less aggressively violent. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Why does he become lovable though? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I lo- ever really like loved him, but. I no, no, I'm not talking about this. He's awful in the entirety of this movie. I'm talking about in the oh, franchise. Okay. He eventually he better, becomes like yeah. this funny, supportive, you know, uh, side character. And you just forget that he was like this horrible monster. In this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Burgess Meredith sounds like a woman's name to me. Um, Who's Burgess Meredith? Burgess Meredith is Mickey. Uh, the the old trainer. Old. Yeah, oh. Rock. You know, he talks yeah, like this. Rock. rock. He's also Such a caricature. famously from a, like a lot of famous Twilight Zone episodes, and he's most notable for being the Penguin on the old Batman TV show. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he has same voice. <laughs> yeah, he's got that voice forever. He's in that Twilight Zone episode where the, he's like a bookworm yeah. guy with like yep. the big glasses. all the time in the world. Yep, and he goes into the he works at a bank. Do you know this one, Carl? He's like a bookworm. All he wants to do is read books, right? And he works at a bank, and everyone treats him like shit. And they make him go down into the vault to, like, get something or whatever. And while he's down there, a, a bomb goes off, a, like an end-of-the-world bomb. And it, like, kills everyone and destroys the world. And he goes back up to the surface, and the whole bank is leveled. Like, everything is crumbled in, in you know, disarray. And he realizes, at first, you know, he's, like, horrified. But then he realizes, like, he's got all the time in the world now to read books, his love. You know, that's his favorite thing to do. And he goes to the library, and he gets piles and piles of books, and he gets them all, and he sits down. And he's like, all right, here I go. And he opens the first book and he looks down and his glasses fall off and they break and then he can't read. And that's it. That's the end of the episode. Wow. <laughs> but th- there was actually a sequel episode where he looks up and he sees that there's a big glasses store that's intact across the street. He's like, <laughs> oh, oh and it's like a much happier episode. Yeah. Um, isn't that the origin story of uh, Mr. Magoo? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So here's the, we're watching the scene now where he's telling the young girl to stop being such a whore. Uh, <laughs> I mean, a lot of the stuff is of the time, yeah. but. Well-intentioned, but did not age well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So before we get into like, you know, the ins and outs of this movie, I think it's time for us to do our staple uh, two minute summary of the plot. And I believe it is Colin's turn. Oh, I don't think that's a good idea. Oh no. But, um, I can do it. I, it might be shorter than one minute. <laughs> I can do it. Colleen can do it. You want to do it? Yeah. We, we've never had a guest do it. Oh, that'd be yeah, funny if we, we episode, just make the guests do it. Yeah. I mean, I could do it and then you could cut it and have Colin do it if I can't do it. Wow. No, no. If you if you struggle, that'll make it so much better. Yeah. It has to be two minutes. It's well, be he's gonna, it can't be under o- two minutes. over two minutes, although it often is. So it doesn't really matter. It, Harris, I don't think. I think he's only gone under two minutes like one time. <laughs> All right. <laughs> really All right. I used to be so good at it. I don't know what I happened. Know. I, could I do stopped it. practicing. All right. right. You ready, Colin? Okay. I'm ready. Yes. All right. Ready? Go. Okay. So it starts off with a really nice, gritty, naturalistic boxing scene. We see Rocky getting pummeled, and then he pummels the guy. Is very sweaty, um, very bloody. And then he comes out, and he goes into the locker room, and and the I don't know. Some guys like forty bucks to get your head pounded. That's not really good (laughs) and then he he leaves and uh, he goes for a walk and he sees an acapella group like the whitest acapella group in the dirty streets of philly singing and um he's friends with everybody and that's weird and he says that you're getting better every year guys and then he goes home and he loves turtles he has two turtles um one's name is jab and slab too many details okay sorry <laughs> then cuff, he, cuff and link oh cuff and link yes and then he's he's got a uh, records on the wall and he looks at himself and he's sad he wants more from life and then we see him the next day and he goes to the pet store and he sees the girl adrian who's obviously the apple of his eye but she's very quiet and shy and they both seem like people think they're nobodies scum bum oh oh okay and then everything from there he gets a chance to do a fight with the the world champion apollo creed and because his name is the italian stallion they think it's going to be a great uh centennial fight and gets the offer and then 
oh no, blah, 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 I don't know. And then they fight, and then he falls in love, and <laughs> that's it. And then he becomes a hero. You know, you, you made it with 30 seconds to spare. <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, I feel like you covered most of the major things. I, okay, and then if I only have 20 more seconds, he likes to punch meat, meat in the freezer. He and meat. We and all like to beat our his meat. His house is really dirty. His clothes are really fly. And that's pretty much the movie. I actually don't like his hat. I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. I like the hat and the, the, the coat. And I, I like the fingerless his never, too. His nose never was broken. I'll tell you who's got good clothes. Apollo Creed. Yes. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. You like the Uncle Sam look? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> his suits, his uh, everything. He's Apollo Creed is a stylish man. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's a man of showboating. He's a man of uh, of charm. He's a man of good I, looks. I loved the uh, the scene at the beginning when the bartender is like when they're watching Rocky and the bartender are watching Apollo Creed on TV, and the bartender makes a racist you know calls him a slur and is like, "You believe this this you know whatever is a the champ?" and he calls him a clown. And Rocky's like, what are you talking about? This guy's great. You know, it's like, yeah. you know, like you could tell that he just has so much, you know, even though like you could tell that like it, it seemed very authentic, like a like a Philly bartender would think that a showboating guy, no matter how good he was, they probably were saying Muhammad Ali was a clown, you know, like no matter how talented he was, they wouldn't like that. But Rocky is a boxer and he appreciates a yeah. great boxer and like has so much respect for him. I definitely think that's the parallel. I think there, yeah. you know, there were people who definitely thought that of Muhammad Ali. Yeah, and I just think Rocky just constantly heart of gold, you know. Yep. You never met someone with such a pure heart. Yeah. He looks good in those, like, clear uh, hipster glasses. Grandma, grandma glasses? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, They're like Estelle Getty glasses. <laughs> everything he wears is, like, sexy. These, like, fingerless gloves. This, like, you know, high neck sweatshirts <laughs> with a leather jacket. He's got, like, the softest lips for, like, <laughs> with the hardest... The hardest face. With the, the hardest jaw, <laughs> softest lips. His, and his unbroken nose is actually kind of small and pointy. And I was thinking, like, did Sly get his nose broken at some point? In yeah, some his nose movies? looks totally his different, his nose right? is much bigger now. I yeah. always thought that was, like, kind of a joke. Is like, he says his nose hasn't been broken, but it, like, probably has. It's just something he says. because No, it's, like, very Romanesque in this movie. It's it's quite lovely. Yeah, and that's, like, the Burgess Meredith thing is, like, this is what, this is your big claim to f fame is that nobody ever broke your nose. You can't win a fucking fight. <laughs> yeah. I, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I definitely think he's he's been hit in the nose before. He, But he's very young and pretty in this movie. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's kind of funny to be reminded that he looked like this once because he... It's, I think by the time he got into the 80s, his face had taken a little more abuse. I mean, they were actually punching each other sometimes in these movies. Um, oh, yeah. Accidentally or intentionally. Uh, and ironically, I found that... Uh, I had read somewhere that, you know, the big... In the final fight, the big gags are that he gets his nose broken almost immediately for the first time ever. Yeah. Um, and then later he breaks Creed's ribs, and Apollo has to, like, sort of protect his right side because he's fighting with broken ribs. Yeah. But ironically, the two actors suffered the opposite injuries. Uh, Carl Weathers actually busted his nose filming the final fight, and Sylvester Stallone cracked some ribs. Yeah. So they kind of had the opposite, the in, their characters' opposite injuries. Uh, I funny. mean, it looked really, really real. It also, like, story-wise really works um, based on what you were talking about earlier. Like, is Apollo Creed just a showboat? Is he really, like, the one of the greatest boxers of, you know, this fictional world that ever lived? And it's like, oh, yeah, no, he's, like, he's boxed a lot, and he's tough, and he's going to, like, break his ribs and keep fighting, like, just for the pride of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like. And they set it up when he enters the ring. The the announcers even say he doesn't look like he's in very good shape. So, but but should be fine to take care of this, you know, tomato yeah. can, you know, like so. They basically set it up to be like he probably didn't take this very serious. They're setting it up constantly. His his corner man Duke has like two or three times is like, dude, you should look at this guy. He's a southpaw. He's beating the shit out of this piece of meat. I don't know. This guy could be dangerous. <laughs> yeah. and, and he doesn't listen. And he doesn't listen. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah it's fine. It's, we're just going to put on a show, you know? I and love the, Duke. The, the great line he's that Duke has character. in the fight where he's like, he doesn't know this is a show. He thinks this is a fight. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, I, I was surprised how much uh, boxing there wasn't in this movie. <laughs> uh, it really comes down to literally like the last eight minutes of this movie. 
is bo- is the boxing match. Yeah, and, you know, you see him in the beginning, the very first scene, a little bit, and that's it. Right, that's it. It's two fights. The very yeah. first one for a minute, and then the last one, which is like nine minutes, and you see like three full rounds. Right. Yeah, which is a common mistake of modern movies is that they put the fighting or the you know the gun action all the way through, and so you don't have that showdown or the emotional. Right, release. there's nothing uh, right. it, it built. There's no buildup. You've seen yeah. it. Your eyes have seen it. Your you know it just doesn't have the same power as if you save it and you build up the character. And then I just like that about '70s movies is they know how to pace things. Yeah, and you could do. I mean, you could. Do, they could have done more fights, but there was no, you know there weren't. There, it wasn't like he was on a, the road to the championship like you have in most boxing movies or like you know Raging Bull cuts to different fights throughout his life. But some yeah. of them are just like it cuts to the fight and you just see like the end of the fight where he loses the decision or whatever. Yeah. Or just see him getting pummeled in the ring or hit, see him winning, you know, but like you're I'm not seeing. Sorry. It's not about the action of the thing. I love how this movie does not ever pretend that he's going to win. Mm, yeah. <laughs> <At all>. like, <laughs> yeah. That's so good. But he, he, <laughs> but he overperforms even the low expectations yeah. he's set. Like he wants to go the distance. Everyone else is like, don't get killed. You yeah. know, like try to last a round. Um, and you know, they make it so that he actually could have won. He knocks Apollo out for like 15 seconds in the first round that if he had gone to his corner, he might've won the fight there, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the point is they, and they make that clear in this movie that like, yeah, he could have won. Had had there been like, right. A little more time to that round. That's the whole thing is that he was a contender. He like, uh. He held his own, and that's really like all he wanted he to do with that he his had life. The value yeah. that he, but then at the end of the fight, when everyone wants to talk to him about how he's done this, accomplished this great thing, this suddenly isn't the most important thing to him. He doesn't even care about the announcement of who won. Like, right. Right. he's not even paying attention. He's not even paying attention. Yeah. Right. He's already yeah. achieved his boxing goal, but he's also realized that his boxing goal wasn't the most important thing to him anymore. Or and maybe he's been beaten in the head so many times that he only is capable of one, only one or defining one thought. Yeah, he only knows one name anymore. <laughs> um, did you know that the, that actually wasn't the scripted ending? And I think they even shot a different ending. Um, the original ending was Adrian couldn't come out of the locker room, didn't want to see him fight, and just waited for him in the locker room. And he was in the ring, and they announced the split decision winner... And it was originally they had a, apparently they had a huge fight because Sloan didn't want wanted it to be a one sided you know a Creed beat him handily, um, but uh, the director insisted that it be a split decision in a close fight. <laughs> it um, must have got boring. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they uh, so they announced the decision. Everyone reacts. Rocky leaves the ring and like gets carried out by the appreciative fans. And then when he gets back to the locker room, he and Adrian quietly walk away hand in hand. And it's actually the still in the poster was the last shot of the movie of them walking down the hallway together. Oh, wow. And it's such a better version that they did here. Like it's just so much more like with him not caring and in the ring just yelling her name and her like her running, running into the out. ring. Yeah. The most yeah. iconic yeah. moment. It, maybe yeah. the meat punching is more iconic, but I think that's yeah. maybe the <laughs> most or the, or the iconic. step the step running, you the know. Step there's, running. There's step a lot running, of iconic yes. moments in this, but I mean the ending is totally iconic and hits it like really does this not win best picture if they have the slightly worst ending? You know like cuz it's just so good. it's such a great way cuz it's thematically it's it's centering that relationship. Yeah, I want to say like because because it reminds me of the family thing too, where you know penguins and the penguin parents they go to get the food, and then the little baby penguin waits, and like there's thousands and thousands of penguin parents and thousands and thousands of penguin babies, and through all that noise, the the moms can and dads can hear their baby chirping, mm-hmm. and they find them through the crowd, and it reminds me of that like these two people are like become one like mm-hmm. they're just one soul that's love like they're the each other's family and they can it's like they can find each other she knew All he this needed her and noise. oh yeah they knew that she, he knew that she needed her or what am I trying to say she knew he needed him at that moment like he was calling her right. but she could hear it almost in her heart yeah. not in yeah. her ears but i thought Burgess Meredith was the penguin <laughs> <laughs> i hear you rock i hear you i'm right next to you <laughs> Yeah, big golf. <laughs> um, let's go back. <laughs> Sorry. Let's talk about its Academy Award win. Like, do we have the nominees from that year we could look up? Uh, let's know what it beat. Let's know what was going on in 1976. What, what other what other movies do we know came out that year? Um, Star Wars was the next year. I know hmm. that. 1976, we're talking about. Yes. Okay. Let's see. 
And that's uh, Academy Awards, 1977 Academy Awards. We have. Should we play top four to guess the other four? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see what they are, and I will uh, see if they're even guessable. Sounds difficult. Um, all right. Wow, they really bury the best picture on IMDb pretty pretty far down. Um, it's unimportant. Yeah, exactly. Oh, here it is. Okay. So, um, okay. Well, I could give you some clues and you guys could guess it. Yeah, this will be fun. Yes. Um, all right. So, there's one movie called Bound for Glory that you guys wouldn't guess because I don't even know what the fuck that is. Bound for Glory, I'm pretty sure, was written by... Um, by Bob Jones from oh. uh, from uh, USC. Wait, is that is that a prequel to Homeward Bound? Um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's either that. I, mean, I think Bound for Glory is like a Vietnam War. It's movie. a Hal, <laughs> it's a Hal Ashby movie yes. about Woody Guthrie. Oh, okay, Do you, can you see who the writers are? Um, yes, and it's not Bob Jones. Damn it! Um, it might have been uncredited. Okay, so Rocky won, um, but the other three were all famous 1970s movies, very famous. I would describe them all as super famous. Mm-hmm. Um, one of them we've already mentioned here today. Um, Star Wars? No, in the context of um, one of the actors in this movie is also in that oh, movie. Oh, Godfather? It's not Godfather, um, but it's another one of those movies that you said he's in. Oh, oh, Maniac? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, but that guy, that guy, oh, oh, Raging Bull. No, nope. oh, uh, but you're oh, in the oh, right, oh. you're in the right neighborhood. Oh, Scorsese. Taxi Driver, Taxi Driver, oh, taxi yes, driver. Yes. yes, yes, Taxi Driver was one of the nominees. Oh, wow. What it beat, this taxi, beat driver? taxi Driver? This beat Taxi Driver. Wow, whoa, um, that's crazy. Heart goes a long way, I think. Yeah, yeah. Right. movies that have the heart. The biggest critique of this movie was that it was too schmaltzy uh, from the critics. Most critics love this. It got r- really high reviews. But a lot of people compared it to like a Frank Capra movie except schmaltzier. Mm. Um, and yeah. it's true. It's got a very Ted Lasso vibe of like the super nice guy who's just trying to do things the right way and succeeds, you know? Schmaltzy um, does not always hurt you in awards. Exact, season. Exactly. And so the these other two movies... Um, yeah, Taxi Driver, not exactly a feel-good movie. <laughs> no, yeah. definitely not. I was just going to say something. But, like I, I mean, I love this movie, but I love Taxi Driver. I, I feel like Taxi Driver is a much better it's film. A, it's a better movie, but I do understand why this won the Academy yeah. Award. <laughs> um, it was also the vibe. This is a very American movie, and it's like the Bicentennial was that year. And, like, I don't know. It's just about, oh. like, the underdog. It's an underdog story. Yeah. And I think, like, people wanted that at that at that time culturally. You know what might have happened? They might have tried to give the Academy Award to Taxi Driver, and they were like, you talking to me? And there was a confusion <laughs> there. <and> <laughs> Taxi <laughs> Driver? Okay, okay. I feel like this is where the pivot happens. Taxi Driver is sort of a, mo- a movie that's a commentary on the 70s and the culture of – of, of the nation like and the way it's it feels like it's going like we're falling apart we're all going insane like this is like an evil place right and then rocky is kind of the movie that's like painting the picture of like what the world could be like if we if we yeah. look past this evil if we look past like what's happening like and just focus on the you know love and like the things that matter or whatever like this is kind of the direction this is the go. optimism to counteract all the cynicism yes. and you know kind of paranoia that was in the world and okay, so this is an interesting. This plays into our other two nominees because they are also both about all the shit, the, all the way the world's falling apart. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're very famous movies. You know them both. Um, I'll give you the directors, and maybe you'll get one of them. <laughs> oh yeah, Alan J. Pacula is the director of one, and Sidney Lumet is the director of the other. Is mm. one not all the King's Men? No, all the. Uh, oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah! You're right. All the kings, uh, all, all the uh, I know it's yeah. all the emperors, ladies. No, it's it's a, it's the one about. Um, <laughs> well, what do we have in America that isn't a king? Um, all the presidents. All, all, the, all the presidents. All the presidents. Men. I knew. Yeah. Ooh, that's right. That's the uh, that's the <laughs> Alan J. Pacula. I knew it. One with uh, obviously Dustin. Another and amazing Redford. film. Yeah, yeah, great, great movie. Um, and all about like sort deep of throat paranoia and right. uh, conspiracies and yeah, how let's keep that for the better government stuff <laughs> <laughs> i'm kidding i'm kidding oh my god um all right so the last one is a sydney lumet movie um I, I feel like if i give you any of the stars oh, wait i know it it's a uh, dog day afternoon nope ah, but that's a oh. good guess that was i think a few years before that would be the same movie. isn't that what's the space nero um, i don't know that's, that's al pacino, al pacino yeah um, um, when are they making Dog Day Evening? You know, <laughs> this okay. This one, this movie. Um, I think the best supporting actor winner. This had multiple. Oh, this is the best lead actor. I, I forgot all about that. Um, Not the graduate. No. Nope. Uh, nope. Best lead actor was Peter Finch. He mm. had a very famous scene where he yells. 
This is about a very uh, specific part of American life that has to do with, it's oh, kind of similar oh. to all the president's men. Is it like um, network or? Yes. Yeah, network. Oh, network. wow. So yeah, amazing So, so good competitions. Yeah, but you can see that this was, of all of them, this was the feel good, you know, yeah, positive it's, one. It's the standout, right? Yep. It's the one that's different. Yep. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. And Stallone was nominated, um, and he lost to Peter Finch. Um, and uh, De Niro obviously was nominated for Taxi Driver. William Holden for Network as well. Um, Burt Young, was who plays uh, what's his name, um, Paulie, mm-hmm. was nominated as well. Oh wow! Oh really? Uh, he lost to Jason Robards for All the President's Men. Burgess Meredith also nominated. Mm. Wow. Um, Lawrence Olivier was also nominated that year for Marathon Man. For this? Oh. And, and <laughs> Lawrence Olivier <laughs> was the... Uh, and Ned Beatty for, net, for like the three minutes that he was in Network got a nomination. Oh, but, wow. Uh, Jason Robards won for All the President's Men. What if Apollo Creed had two trainers and one was Duke and one was played by Lawrence Olivier? <laughs> <laughs> Is it safe? <laughs> <laughs> um, so Faye Dunaway won the Best Actress, but Tali Shire was nominated for that. Um, along with Liv Ullman, Mary Christine Baralt, who I don't know who or her or the movie, and Sissy Spacek for Carrie. Oh, mm. awesome. She was nominated for that? Yeah. That's crazy. Let's. Uh, That's a good segue into Talia Shire. Let's talk about her, who she is, uh, what's going on here, and what else did she really do besides the Godfather. Rocky movies? Well, she, yeah, she was the in the Godfather movies because her brother directed them. Um Brother, that's what yeah. it is. I was telling Kyle, I'm like, she's the daughter of Francis Ford Coppola. Like, then I'm like, wait a minute, that's, that's like, not real. <laughs> she's the wife. That's what it he is. He had her when he was six. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So she was his. Uh, she's his sister, um, and that's pretty much. She wanted to be an actress. This was like, you know, she was trying to have her own career, but her, of course, her biggest roles came in the first two Godfather movies. And a big part of the reason she took this, I think, was because she wanted to do something that wasn't a Francis Ford Coppola movie. And um, interestingly enough, the other actress that I think they were, that I read that they were heavily considering for this um, was, um, why am I blanking on it? Uh, I can't remember. Um, Mm, That is interesting. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) That is fascinating. Um, uh, Susan Sarandon. Uh, oh, that's right, but wow. she was too pretty, too they pretty. said. They were yeah. like, nobody would believe that she's like the mousy pet store worker. Oh, my God. She's, oh. This, what's her name? Talia? She's Talia gorgeous. Shire. Talia yeah. Shire. Yeah, she looks she's great. She's stunning. Yeah. But I do really believe that she could be shy. I mean, she really plays. Mm-hmm. It, she could she be shyer. Sh- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was really good. <laughs> Talia oh Shire. God. <laughs> oh my god. I was I was like trying to figure out a way to make some kind of hobbit joke, but <laughs> that was way easier. <laughs> See, it works better when you let the jokes come to you. <laughs> yeah. Wow. But wow. I was gonna say one more thing about the theme of the movie. Why I think this movie took off so much during that time. Because I talked to my mom and Matt's mom who saw it in high school. Talk to all the moms. All the moms. <laughs> And, you know, they said that, yeah, once people saw it, everyone loved it and that word word of mouth, you know, kind of thing. And I think it's because there isn't so much boxing in it. It's really a Cinderella story where pretty much anyone can insert their own narrative onto this, yes. you know? So they, they don't make it so much of a set piece that you're kind of turned off or it's not your thing or... So I think that was probably really powerful. It was just like everyone could say, oh, I'm I'm him or I'm her and this is my life, and I could succeed, you know, which yeah. I think was is always just, like, really works for people. And that's why Cinderella works. We're not, you know, all um, orphaned girls that live with, like, three evil stepsisters that get invited to a ball, but we all can relate to that story because we want something like that yeah, to happen Yeah, it's, an, it's an every man story. Yeah. It's like, yeah, you can put yourself in, exactly. And it's like there's, uh, you know, all these losers get the win at the end. You know, Mi- yeah. Mickey gets to train a, a great fighter and, um, you know, even t- uh, Polly sort of finds his niche mooching money out of people using Rocky's <laughs> name, you know? Yeah. So they, yeah. they all kind of get their win. And Apollo, even Apollo, gets to retain his title, but he's got to earn it, you know? Yeah, well, he, Rocky's decision or his like whole thing elevates everybody else around him. Yeah. It's not just him. It's like, yeah, all these other people were sort of, I don't know, relying on him or like, I don't know, what is that? What is that trying to say? You know, it's like I I love the the journey of of Apollo Creed as an antagonist. Like, you don't really hate him. You just you see what he is and like why he's doing it and that's it. And like, you know yeah. that he's probably 
you know, stronger and like better trained and, you know, the actual heavyweight champion of the world. Rocky says himself, he's the best fighter in the world. You and, know? <laughs> and in the beginning, he's like, I'm already committed to this and I want to just fight someone that wants to fight me, you yeah. know, like that's like. You know, that's a good question. Who is the, there is no bad guy in this. The loan shark's a good guy. The, you know, the, I mean, the racist bartender, I guess, is the, the worst person yeah. that we see in the movie. You know, <laughs> everyone else is kind of fine. You know, everyone else is pretty good. I mean, I think Mickey and Polly definitely yeah. look like assholes, but you know. Yeah, Polly's Well, it's himself. Yeah. He's his own antagonist. He's, right. he's learning to get over his own, like, you know. What's the word? Insecure? Not insecurity. Like yeah, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. His own things that are stopping him from preventing him from being the person he wants to be, or yeah. or whatever. You know. And I think that that's interesting because I think if you like, you know, we all know like the screenwriting advice things and probably read too much of that shit. But you know, it's always like, oh, there's not enough conflict. There's not enough. You know, who's and and it's evidence that you can definitely have, you know, a compelling story where there isn't a lot of. Uh, you know, direct conflict where there's nobody necessarily that's the bad person or the bad guy that's standing in the way that it's really mostly internal. This is one of the scenes that hasn't aged I, totally great. Oh, yes. Yeah. Right. This, um, Rocky, aware that his best move, because he has a pipe hanging from his ceiling, is to reach up and grab the pipe to flex his muscles. Yeah. It worked for me. He's got a bunch of... <laughs> He's got a bunch of knives in the walls. That's what he uses to like hang his coat on. And <laughs> yeah, stuff. exactly. It's like knives and machetes are machetes, his coat yeah. And then he invites her back and she doesn't want to come in and he sort of goads her in, immediately starts taking off his clothes and then yeah. backs her into a corner and then when she wants to leave, puts his hand on the door and is like, don't go. And, and then makes her take her articles of clothing off yeah. too. Yeah. And it's like, we know him at this point. We know that he's a nice guy, We, but there's definitely a kind of... And, and we also know her, and we've seen her peeking at him throughout the movie, you know? I was going to say, we do see that they have eyes at each other, and they yeah. kind of blush at each other. They've been knowing each other for five or six years. Right. She wouldn't have come up, probably, they if she wasn't interested. Date. Yeah, we know that she's into him, but there is something a little coercive about everything he does. Yeah, if, if all that backstory were not here, and this was just a first date, this is like a horror right, movie exactly. moment for a woman. But just with the fact that she's known him for this long and finally went on the date with him, we kind of know where her head's at at this point. Yeah. But yeah. And then she doesn't kiss him right away. And then she, and then she sort of runs the show when it's like, she's like, okay, I'm into this. But yeah. I don't know. I, I still am like, is she shy or is she like not okay? <laughs> <laughs> Colin is straight up concerned. Uh, yeah. And then she drops his ass to the floor in a second here. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, God, do we have anything negative to say about this movie? Where I have some, a couple. All right, let's go. Things that, I mean, the schmaltziness, is that how you say it? Schmaltzy? Schmaltzy, yeah. yeah I mean, I definitely, <laughs> for, I was like, oh, I love the naturalist, naturalistic boxing scene at the beginning. And then when he got home and he looked in the mirror and at his childhood picture, I almost vomited. <laughs> I really hated that. I don't mind looking at the family photos, but like that was just a little heavy handed. Yeah. And the way then, he like took it out and like actually. Yeah. Like, it, was, it was just like. Oh. And that scene was so great because it's, he talks to the turtles. He talks I love to the mirror. That. You just get a sense of him and then he does the, the picture thing. And I was like, that's oh, a step too far guys. Exactly. I was like, oh my God, I can't believe someone wrote this and directed this. Yeah. It's so real. So beautiful. Yeah. And then the apartment is just like a scotch too dirty for realism. Like it's, I love the grittiness of this whole world, but as a production, former production designer, I was like, come on. What is his rent? Like Like $8? (laughs) (laughs) See, that's the thing. Like, I think the seventies really were this scummy. No, I was going to say, I'm not sure how much production design is going on in a lot of things because of their budget and their schedule. They shot this in 28 days. And I think a lot of this stuff was just as is. Yeah. That's, that's what I've, I've heard a lot of this stuff is yeah. just as is. I know Everything else was, was perfect. The yeah. gym is perfect. But I think that like there's something about his apartment that it went maybe a little too far. Like they kind of t- took some like smoke and torched the sides of things. And then like. I doubt they did I, that. I have actually lived in apartments where like I'm a pretty clean person where some sometimes you just can't clean that stuff if you live in a rundown shitty apartment. It could it's be. beyond cleaning. It could it just, be. You know, I, and also he is not the kind of guy who's doing a lot of cleaning, by the way. Yeah. We, we see that also. Yeah. It was it was maybe it was like almost I, I'm saying this movie was so perfect mm. that I'm looking for like tiny little right. things. The little I've never actually been to philadelphia but most of my like perceptions of what i think philadelphia is like are based on like 
the this Rocky movie. movies. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the Pat's, old New York accents. <laughs> yeah. Pat's cheesesteaks is in this movie. Uh, I like that. I never noticed that before. But there's like in Philadelphia, there's these two famous cheesesteak places, um, Pat's and Geno's, and they're directly across the street from one another. And it's like a constant debate of like who makes the best Philly cheesesteak. Is it Pat's or Geno's? And like mm. you have to stand in line and then when you get up you have to order a certain way you have to like say they have like their lingo like, like soup nazi yeah yeah like you, I, w- I want the meat uh wit, you know, wit, wit whiz wit whiz yeah, yeah exactly and if you say it the wrong gas. or you take too long they send you to the back of the line they <laughs> yeah, just like yeah, go to exactly. the next guy nice. yeah yeah um so that's pretty cool the only real philly accent i heard in this entire movie was when he first walks into the bar which that bar was perfect. I was like, I've I've never even drank in Philly, but I've been in that bar somewhere. You know, <laughs> yeah. like that, there's that bar everywhere. Um, but when he walks in, the woman at the bar like yells something at him, like about like his busted up eye, and he tells her he had to fight. And she was the only person who actually had like something that seemed like a real Philly accent. What is the difference between a Philly accent and like generic East Coast? Uh, I I wish I could do it, but it's like <laughs> the um, it's like the. Do you see that mayor of East Town. Water. They say water. Yeah, water. water. Yeah. Okay. And uh, yeah, it's like if you watch that or if you watch, there's some other, um, they try to do it in Silver Linings Playbook, but honestly, they I don't think they did it very well in that. But it really, the Mayor of East Town one was yeah. one that, where they were really, they were leaning into it heavily. But when you actually know people from Philly sometimes, you're like, oh yeah, that's a real thing. You guys talk very strange. Yeah. Okay. So it's water. And then in New York, it's water. Water. Yeah. And then in Boston, it's water. 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 Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> water, water, water. <laughs> well, in Texas, we always had what a burger. And when I was really young, I used to think people were saying water burger. Because what, like, a burger. what a burger. What a burger. What a burger. Yeah. Uh, should we? Interesting story, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we're at least just you full remembered of them. it. Full <laughs> yeah. of them. Uh, you want to do top four? Yeah. Oh, we're there already? Sure. Yeah, we could. Oh, who, we, who's going to run? Oh, we should do it boxing style, one on one. Okay. All, All right. right. So, how do we want to do this? Who's going to run it? I can run it. You want to run it? All right, me, me versus Colin. Or is this the end? No, uh, no, 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 this is about no. halfway. We, oh, okay. Yeah, we got about because I got a lot more to say. We're breaking things up. Yeah. We got we like all, we should all have more to say. Yeah, we got we, like four or five more. We hours. got some segments. We yeah. got segments. We haven't <laughs> even talked about like the final fight or any of that. Oh, stuff. okay, okay. We got lots of stuff. All right, so um, we're gonna do top four. Have we never done Sylvester Stallone before? I feel like we might have done him. Um, Cliffhanger? I, I don't know if we've done him, but we're going to save him for another Rocky movie, maybe. We oh, weren't, okay. We yeah. weren't doing top four yet when we did Cliffhanger, I don't think. I don't think so. Not on the Patreon episodes. Yeah. And uh, today we are going to do Mr. Carl Weathers. Oh, oh so hell yeah. Yep. I think um, I can do it right now. This could be pretty easy, but we're going to give it a try. Um, all right, so how are we doing this one-on-one thing? It's just... Uh, just back and forth. Just and back then and forth. Yeah, I don't know, and then we'll switch it up. We'll throw Colleen if you want to play. You're gonna no, you're gonna add um, like sound effects, right? Like boxing sound effects. Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah. All right, all right. So, um, <laughs> just randomly, I'm going to say that uh, Colin should go first. All right. Uh, Rocky. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm the big right hook. Uh, all right, Matt. <laughs> ooh, ooh, I'm hurting from that one. <laughs> all right, uh, <laughs> stepping up. Let's see. Uh, I'm going to say uh, Predator. Yeah. Oh. All right. All right. I like Action packed one. first round here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. We're going, I'm ready. We're going blow for blow. Oh, can I? Show? Oh. Oh. <laughs> so it's a three person one. boxing match. <laughs> yeah. Oh, three, a three oh, person oh, boxing oh, match. Okay. No, we usually do it that way, though. Okay. Yeah. This is the first time. This was your idea. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm so excited that I have another movie that I know he's in. Oh, all right. Should we? Uh, all right. Just go for it. A random person from the audience has just jumped into the brain. <laughs> and our oh, my God. That goes right out the window so quickly. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I wasn't in love with it, anyways. Yeah. Go for it. Action, action, Jackson. I action, wish Action act- Jackson was right. Action Jackson is such a great guess. It is wrong. Oh, oh He's man. Not in it? <laughs> no. He is in it, but that's not one of his top four. It's top four. I mean, it, yes, it is one of Carl Weathers' best movies, but top four is not always. Colin has the picked best. up the random woman and thrown her back into the audience. <laughs> <laughs> my God. All right, oh, Colin, my God. back to you. What a scene. It's, a, it's pandemonium. <laughs> it's pandemonium. <laughs> uh, Rocky 2. Oh, oh man! I know what my next guess is. Yeah, I'm I know what my next it. guess is. Well, Matt, you get the next guess. So. I'm gonna say Rocky Four. <laughs> yes, wow. I knew it. Wow! Oh, oh. and Matt is on top. Yes. What's your name? You Italian stallion. Oh yeah, I'll be the. Uh, ooh, 
Be the Italian stallion. Can I be the scotch the something? The scotch. Scotch and egg. <laughs> <laughs> scotch egg. The scotch, the scotch, scotch egg. egg. <laughs> the scotch egg, Matt McGregor. <laughs> oh, yeah. Fighting back. Um, all right, Colleen, you want to get on the board here? There's one more. There's one more to go. They have not said it yet, Colleen. It, it, it could be a oh, Rocky me? movie. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh a, it's getting confusing with Colin and oh, Colleen. Oh, oh, she's back oh. in? No, no, no. Put yeah, Colin no, back in. That was just her guest. Uh, guest. Okay, all right, Jackson, all right. Jackson, guest. So, all right. <laughs> Colin, you have an opportunity to, to push this to a draw. Happy Gilmore. Wow. wow. Oh, I love that movie. I was, I was going to guess that. It's all in the hips. It's all in yep. the hips. So we each got two? You each got two. Oh, give it, also, we really give it a little tappy. Tap, 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 He's also the same character in Little Nicky, which, you know, a lot of people. We don't speak of Little Nicky. Yeah, Nikki don't here. like to. You know, I saw Little Nicky in the theater when I was a kid, and I just remember absolutely hating it. Like, it was, I did not laugh. I thought it sucked. I went. Uh, Wait, is this story going to end with you watching it again and then not hating it? No, I was going to say I'm curious to watch it maybe again and see, like, I don't know, what was so bad about it. I, I couldn't tell you, you know. It had to be bad because you're a huge fan yeah. of Adam Sandler, so I, I doubt it I mean, good. I have a really weird relationship with Adam Sandler. I really, even as a kid, only liked Happy Gilmore, especially Billy Madison, um, and, like, The Wedding Singer. And then after that, or Waterboy, I kind of liked, too. And then after that, I was like, okay, all these movies suck. Yeah. <laughs> mm. He's got like a hundred more. I remember that. going to see Little Nicky with my friend Kevin, and I, and we got out of it, and I was like, it was okay. It was like not the best Adam Sandler movie, but it was passable. And he was like, that was awful. <laughs> 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 like, that was bad. I'm a 10-year-old kid. His worst, yeah, worst, <laughs> worst movie is Mr. Deeds. That oh, one oh I like Mr. Deeds. <laughs> Wait, so have you never seen Jack and Jill, or do you like Jack? I don't, I don't even know that it, that oh, exists. Okay. I've seen Jack so and Jill. He's, he has made worse than oh, Mr. Wow, Deeds. Oh wow! Yeah, just <laughs> Jack and Jill has a really great scene in it, though. I the, saw the, I saw Eight Crazy Nights in the theater. That's his animated film. Oh, I never saw that. That was bad. Uh, Jack and Jill. Just the best part of that is that um, he's an advertising uh, like. Guy. director director creative director yeah. yeah and um he's trying to get al pacino signed on to do commercials for dunkin donuts so that al pacino can advertise for the dunkachino and like the very final scene in the movie is like literally the al pacino dunkachino commercial and it's like musical he's like singing and dancing and it's <laughs> it's it's just great all right i'll check it out but it's also super creepy because um the plot of the movie is that he tries to get Jill, who Al Pacino is infatuated with, to like, you know, convince Al Pacino to. Jill is played by Adam Sandler. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's, um, interesting. Yeah. yeah, it's terrible. Oh boy. <laughs> All right, here's the Pat scene. Oh, we just missed it. They're outside of Pat's right now. Yeah, this is where the loan shark gives him five hundred dollars. I mean, the other thing from a film school background thing, script level, the plants and payoffs in this movie are a plentiful. And, you know, if you think of like, there's the, the dog at the beginning and then he gets the dog at mm -hmm. the end. And then there's um, like, he gets called a meat bag. They're like, you're just a meat bag. And then he punches the crap out of the meat, mm -hmm. which is the bag. Well, not really a bag of meat, but it's meat. It's close. Enough. It's the closest thing to a carcass. Bag of meat. And that's what makes him win. So he's like taking that insult and turning it around. And then there's there's other ones. There's so many, but I can't think of them all. Somebody called him stairs and then he runs up. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was, yeah, there was also a lot of things that they did because it was cheap that I think really work for this. Um, there are a lot of things they had to do because they didn't have the money to do better. Th like they didn't have the money to close down any Philly streets. So they literally just had him run around Philadelphia and the people that are watching, he's not a, nobody knows who he is. The people that are watching him and the brilliance of that is all those people that he was running by and the, like the stalls, the guy who threw, throws him an orange, apparently that was unscripted. No, Some guy just threw him an orange as he ran so by. Great. Um, and the people that are looking at him are, you know, it works for the story because it's like, oh, hey, th this is a contender. This is that guy who's going to follow right. Apollo He's Creed. a local hero. We know who he is. But yeah. really, they're probably mostly looking at the freaking cameras that they have in this truck that are driving by probably multiple times. Mm -hmm. um, and the uh, the ice skating rink that they go to on the date, they were supposed to have like 500 extras there to be skating around the rink with them. And then when they got there, they only had like six. 
they could only find like a, f- a few extras. So Sylvester Stallone was like, oh, this sucks. What are we going to do? So he just wrote the, he wrote that the rink was closed. Which is and amazing. And they had a private date. And yeah, it's like, it works, you know? Yeah, it's actually it, it, better than if they had oh just if it was just them skating around a, a full rink. You know, it is better because it shows a character thing in him that he's able to sweet talk people. He's like so genuine and so like yeah, whatever. You know, he he knows how to talk to people, and, and it's a more memorable date than just like eh, we want ice skating. I don't yeah, know. it's and probably it, easier to shoot too without. Like, and also because he doesn't have really have money to maybe go to the full on right. Yeah, you yeah. know, to do the real date, so just give him yeah. sliding. That's a the cheapest dollars. date he could do. Yeah. They didn't use CGI for when he drank those eggs. That was real. <laughs> yeah. yeah, very gross. The the ice rink part also reminds me of Happy Gilmore because of uh, <laughs> friends Mark. listen to endless, endless love in the dark. Love. Yeah. I love that <laughs> when they cut to the guy like <laughs> the, 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 the Zamboni operator Zamboni guy, yeah. is singing along. <laughs> um, another thing we should mention is that this is the first movie, um, not the first movie, but one of the first movies. Ever made. <laughs> no. It's one of the first movies to use a, a Steadicam, which was just invented earlier this year. Um, and it's actually the first movie was Marathon Man, uh, which came out the same year. Um, I thought it was The Shining was one of the first movies to use. Yeah, it. but that came out later, a few, a few years after. Yeah, yeah. but the, so these are the first. This is the first year that Steadicam was actually used, and this and Marathon Man were the two sort of biggest movies um, to use it, uh, and it was still very experimental. Actually, the guy who was trying to sell it, who invented it, um, sh- John Steady. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Actually, I think it's John I, Steady Dash Cam. <laughs> is his oh, yeah. Yeah. I thought his first name was Stedman. <laughs> Stedman, Stedman Cam. <laughs> <laughs> um, he actually lives in Philly and shot his girlfriend running up the steps as a trial thing. And then when they were when they decided they were going to use the Steady Cam, they saw the shot and they were like, "Oh, we're doing that shit." <laughs> yeah, that's so <laughs> you funny. You know, we're doing that. <laughs> nice. Well, that was the other thing I I thought was just so amazing with the amount of effort that he puts into every physical movement. Like I know, you know, I guess he's an athlete in his own right. But when he's running and then he keeps going faster and faster. Oh, isn't it crazy how fast uh, he gets? I mean, that is really fast. I was a runner. I used to run track, and like that was really fucking fast. Like yeah, the sprint scene is like you could see that he. It's like at the end of his run, and they shoot it, you know, sideways, and the the steady cam is moving along with him. I think that might have been a car. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) it's probably a car, car, but it's moving along with him, and it's he speeds up, and you could tell that he's not running his jogging pace anymore. He's at a sprint. And yet he just keeps on going faster, faster and faster. And faster. And yeah, faster. I mean, how many takes do they do? Because that is like... I know, it must have been killing him. And then I love like even just every time he does a physical thing, like he really, you really feel like he threw everything in his body into everything like the person would have to in order to make this happen. See, they took that feeling that you're experiencing and in the later movies, they <laughs> just like make those montages so much better. I was, <laughs> I was about to say like, yeah, that's all true, but like... This is his least physically impressive one, I think. Yeah, like, he's not like lifting logs over his head. Or and no. also, like, he looks freakish in the other ones. Like, <laughs> yeah, some kind of like, yeah. not I even mean, human being type of thing. Even like, in the second one, they 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 get him really shredded yeah. and just bulked up. But it, by the fourth one, he looks like he's oh, yeah. like you know sculpted he, from something. He's the living know? embodiment of like an action figure. Yeah, he's and also like, by like the third and fourth one, like no ref, no boxing official referee would allow a man to get in a ring that oiled up <laughs> <laughs> just isn't right uh, i cannot wait till we get to rocky four that's like the pinnacle <laughs> of filmmaking i think um oh, Mickey. <laughs> this is the uh, this is the burgess meredith academy award winning scene um or academy award nominated scene here where he's getting rejected and literally like he says he, he says i'm 76 years old and then just stops in mid-sentence because he doesn't even want to like explain that like i this is my last shot you know like i'm not going to get another chance like this and he just realizes he blew it, and he just walks out, you know? And then I love Rocky comes out of the bathroom because he thinks he's gone. And then is like... Oh, you're still here. Oh, you're still there. And then freaks out and starts yelling. As he's walking down the stairs, he's just, like, screaming about it. I love this. It's such oh, an so odd good. scene. Like, yeah. it, it would never be done like this today where he's, like, talking to himself, basically. And he's... Yep. But he knows he can hear him. Yep. It's just... Yeah, it's an interestingly, like, blocked out scene. He's, like, waiting for him to leave... There's a lot of mentioning of people stinking in this movie. Yeah, that's, I think that's what fights the the schmaltziness is like these these odd choices that are just so um, unexpected. It just it's like a breath of fresh air. You don't mm. know what's going to happen. Yeah, it defies where you think it's going to go, and so then and then the other things just feel so good when they when you do feel like oh yeah that's what I want to have happen. Mm-hmm. And there's enough tension in the movie that it it's really perfect. You know, I think that's that's pretty rare to have these ty- types of scenes. 
Yeah. Wait. It's, you know, well shot. And yeah. So why why does his nose look different in the later movies? He did he really break it in real life or get a nose job or something? Why would, he get, why would he get a nose job to make his nose bigger? Bigger. Yeah. Or like, yeah, not well, so pointy. You know what, your nose, so pointy. your nose gets bigger every year. Oh, does it? Yeah. That's why old people have gigantic noses. Oh, I see. And your ears, too. Yeah. Your ears, ears and your nose never stop growing. Never Elephants stop. are really old, then. Uh-huh. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, That's just something that Colleen knows. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I broke... <laughs> sorry. Uh, true story, I had a broken nose for a couple of years. Oh. I, like, broke it when I was 11 skiing. And I, I hit a ice, like going down a black diamond and I smashed my face and I had a crooked nose for a couple of years. And then I had a nose job mm. when I was like 13 to reset my nose from it. Cause it was all like mangled and I looked like a boxer. And so I don't know. I feel like he my nose is crooked. It takes I've, one good hit to yeah. have your nose to get out of joint. Like yeah. it sometimes if you don't reset it right away, I mean, I don't know why he wouldn't just fix it as an actor, but I'm just saying. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Although maybe he's just not that vain. No. As me, I have a uh, <laughs> I have a deviated septum, and uh, I I think the last time I broke my nose was There's that train again. Back in like eight years ago, nine years ago, something like that. The last time you broke your nose, yeah, because like if you hit it on the right spot, it'll like just start bleeding. Mm. Yeah, you know, I feel like once you've enough. broken your nose, everything hits your nose. Like yeah. I've, I've had so many like Maya will headbutt me into my nose. And yeah. I'm like, I'm like, why? That's one of my least favorite. I think I was, it was cold out the other day. And you know, your nose is a little sensitive when it's cold out. And I just like rubbed my nose, but I hit the tip of it wrong. And it did that thing where your eyes water and it just burns. Yep. And it's like one of those things that it's, there's a few things that just, I know it's not, it's temporary. It's not going to last long, but for those five or six seconds, I am like, oh, I wish I was dead right now. But that, <laughs> would, that would hurt less than this nose thing. Yeah. I don't know what it is about your nose, but it's like. There's just, n- when they you think about something hitting your nose, it's like the worst thought in the world. Here we go. This is my favorite yeah. scene right here. I love the one-handed <laughs> egg cracks, though, too. I'd love it, too. Like, he does these clean, and it's really impressive. I guess if you're doing it every morning, you get good at it. I also think uh, the commercials with Toucan Sam are, I don't know, there's something wrong there. Follow your nose to Fruit Loops? What does that mean? <laughs> I mean, if for one thing, it's a little redundant. You're always kind of following your nose if you're walking forwards. Mm-hmm. That's true. Unless you, like, you have like a posture where you're like, know one part of your body is like really far like you're leaning you're leaning backwards yeah you've got like a a permanent limbo you're very like pelvis forward yes (laughs) you're walking it's a limbo injury i'm stuck (laughs) like this (laughs) (laughs) um or crabs crabs walked to the side that's true oh speaking of cereal harris remember when you uh wanted to make that thesaurus themed cereal Synonym toast crunch. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate. I appreciate. You tried to get the, that in. The length of time. I knew that he was not going to let it go. I knew that he was going to going to save it for at some point and bring it up again. But oh boy, you knew. Uh, in fact, this all goes back. Like he brought up Toucan Sam yep. specifically yeah. to segue yeah. into this. He did, he did. Did. You know him so well. <laughs> he was like, he's just been, he's spending this entire episode half check checked out. Out because he's just looking for opportunities to bring up cereal. Again. He's like nose, nose. We're talking about noses. Uh, follow your nose. Oh, oh, oh two can Sam. Great, he has a cereal. Here we go. I know. We almost moved on too, and I was like, no, no, we're not moving on. Is there <laughs> no, is no, there no, a no, cereal no. called corny corn puffs? Corn, corn pops. pops. Oh, pops. although corny corn puffs would be a pretty. Because <laughs> I was going to say Colin should make a cereal called corny puns, but oh yes, uh, corn puns, yeah, corn puns, yeah, corn yeah puns. super sugar corn puns. <laughs> <laughs> that would be with Colin. Oh, I'd like to do that. I'd like to be like the mascots also, and I'd like to do like um a snap, crackle, and pop thing, but it's just me in three different outfits. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I think you should make like a cereal. A series on your uh, Instagram, like each of you is a different cereal. Well, uh, I don't know if you know this, but License to Watch has already invented a cereal. Oh, no, I Lucky did not. Blarms. Lucky Blarms. Lucky <laughs> Blarms. Each, each of Blarms. The, the secret ingredient is Blumpkin. I, I, like, I like how the first time he tries to get up these steps, he can't even make it. You I know, love like that, too. There, okay, I, I will say this. We didn't talk about, like, seeing this movie as a kid or, like, our first time. I, I, I'm so shocked that, like, I, I didn't remember anything about this movie, barely anything. Um, I, I think the last time I watched it, I must have been like 10 years old or something, watching it with my dad. I know this is a big dad movie. I'm sure all our dads like love this. Um, but yeah, like watching this movie, I was like shocked by every scene. I'm like, I don't remember this. I don't, he's in, he works for the mob. 
I don't know that. Mm-hmm. He runs up the stairs the first time and do, and he's huffing and puffing. I don't remember that shit. Like all this is new to me, but like th- great. What a great touch. Yeah, like he we actually see the progression of his training. Uh, you know, he goes from like, yeah, being completely out of shape to um, you know, being oh, yeah. the Rocky. Polly who we works know. at the meat packing plant is rubbing his nostrils with his ungloved hands <laughs> and drinking <laughs> alcohol from the bottle and touching and every and piece touching of meat all as he walks the by. Meat. <laughs> yeah, this made me really, meat. really, really, really reconsider eating meat. Yeah. This scene <laughs> on so many levels. Um, yeah, he's, uh, it's definitely, I don't know, this became an iconic scene. I want to know who thought this up, though, that he was just punching meat because they sort of go out of their way to, like, get him. He's talking to Paul, Paulie. Paulie's begging him for a job, as always, and they just randomly happen to be in this meat cooler when Rocky gets pissed off enough to beat up on a slab of beef. Yeah. And then that becomes like a, a gimmick for him. Yeah. Which all sort of makes sense, but it's very shoehorned in, you know? It's he like, like the, punches the meat one time and then does like a little eyebrow raise, right? Like, yeah. Like yeah. I could punch this meat. Punch meat. Well, the other thing I didn't remember about this movie is like the manner in which that Rocky gets roped into like doing the fight. Like, you know, we're so used to, you know, we've seen the Creed movies and stuff recently. Like, I kind of forgot that it was just like essentially a pure luck, like, uh, yeah, pick his name. Co- contest yeah. co- sort of a thing, you know, right. like, oh, this guy sounds he's good. He's got to be a local fighter, he's got to be white, and he's got to have a good name. That was the only qualifications. Yeah, and it's, it is, they make it more believable by them going through, like, names of people, and they're like, nah, he's too this, he's too that. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. these guys are no good. But I, I guess the one thing that's, like, not so believable for me is that they really kind of build it in that Rocky is, like, not a fighter that he's like not anything you know and so they are essentially picking a guy who's like not nothing like they're yeah just but they they knew they i mean that's because they're they're basically picking what they call club fighters which are just local guys who don't who really fight. have a national shot rocky uses the phrase ham and egger when they offer him the deal he's like i'm a ham and egger yeah which like for him to acknowledge that that's basically saying like all those guys that he was fighting with in mickey's gym they're all dead ends. Like, none of them are, like, yeah, sure. Every once in a while you get, like, you know, Joe Frazier came out of Philly and probably fought in one of those gyms. But when he was a teenager, they probably knew, hey, this guy could be great, you yeah, know? Yeah, Any guy who's, you know, in his 20s or older who's still doing this. in Mickey's gym yeah. is a, a dead end ham and egger, and that's just what it is. But, like, that's sort of the the gimmick was take take one of these, you know, guys who can take a punch throw him in the ring, say you're going to give him this opportunity, but there's no real opportunity. Yeah. It's really just a, a showboating, yeah, which exactly. is like, which they also build into that character that like he would do something like this. You yeah. Know? And I mean, the idea is that like Apollo is probably going to carry him for a couple of rounds. Like Apollo could end it in a round, but he's, but he says, I'm going to knock him out in the third, you know, right, like, right, right. But it's actually funny too. Cause I don't think, I think you have to be ranked to be like, you have to be ranked a certain level to become a, a champion so i don't even think he's yeah. eligible to they act like he could become the world champion the heavyweight champion but it's well, really just a, an exhibition but yeah but it really would be an exhibition game there's like all the different like um you know like there's a uh, there's different like boxing commissions or whatever like you may be the heavyweight champion or whatever but you're like the heavyweight champion yeah there's three according different to, yeah exactly yeah, so there's... like you know you have to be recognized by them but I think they're all operating on the same thing that you can't actually contend for a title unless you're ranked above a right. certain level, you know, um, as a fighter, which is why usually most fighting movies have that s- a series of fights because yeah. th- for the guy to get that championship fight, he's got to win other bouts to get. But this is know, the 70s. Contenders. Um, this is interesting because I think uh, this movie, I wonder how much influence other movies had on it because you definitely see like a lot of on the waterfront with him working for the loan shark and, you know, having like the shade, you know, like the shady friends and kind of being from the bad neighborhood. And also that he's kind of washed up that he could have been a contender, but you know, he's uh, just a bum. And like, that's all very on the waterfront. But then there's also a movie called fat city. It's based on a great book by, I think it's the guy's name's Leonard Gardner. It might be the only novel he ever wrote. Great boxing novel about um, club fighters in Stockton, California. And it's basically just like these, fucking losers that are like one of them's over the hill one of them's really young but they're just not they're never going to go anywhere but it's just this book about these losers trying to do the best they can in these terrible circumstances and they don't have aspirations of contending they have aspirations of like not embarrassing themselves maybe making enough money trying not to get drunk you know like that kind of thing and john houston made it into a movie i think like three years before this 
And I wouldn't be surprised if there was some, I, I imagine Stallone was probably familiar with that and a few other like boxing staples when he wrote this. Cause you can definitely feel a lot of those elements in this. Well, you guys mentioned the uh, fight that this is modeled after, uh, the Wepner fight. Yep. Um, I had read that, uh, what was Wepner's first name? Chuck. Chuck, Chuck Wepner sued the, the makers of this movie because he realized that it was his story, you know, and they it was adapted or whatever. And, you know, Stallone denied it and whatever. They went back and forth. And then they ended up settling out of court. So, like... Yeah, I can't believe they settled yeah. because... Wepner didn't it doesn't have much of a case there's like very little similarity but I mean Stallone, Stallone admitted that he was inspired by that fight to write this script yeah but nothing else about the script is you know Wepner was a very different first of all he was much more successful um and he was much I think older um and you know I, I don't know there's the circumstances were very different but you know whatever yeah I guess he got he got paid and, and also this is one of the most profitable movies ever so i'm sure they were like fine here's here's here's, here's a million cut. bucks yeah here's yeah. a million bucks what do we need it because this is a million dollar budget and ended up being the highest grossing movie of 1976 only got knocked out of the box office by star wars the following year and um you know made i think like i don't even know i think the uh, let's see what was the yeah, i, I, I think i read they, it made um, two, 225 million dollars I wonder if they also had to reach a settlement with um, Here we go. the makers of a documentary about boulders uh, over the title. <laughs> <laughs> Look, see the train? The train's always in the background. Uh, um, yeah, $225 million and uh, which is, would be equivalent to $1 billion today wow um also wow. that's 225 million of like box office this movie's probably still making money yeah. you know like it's still people are still probably getting royalty checks for this yeah but now is did sylvester stallone i mean obviously he became like a uh you know a household name after this movie but did he reap the benefits of any of that like was i'm he a, sure he had points being the writer he would have points and being the star he would have so he i'm sure he i don't i shouldn't say i'm sure who knows yeah but and and honestly to to insist on being the lead in it, he might have had to make some concessions, so maybe he gave up his points. Maybe. I don't think, you know, he's clearly a wealthy man. He's not sweating about it, but. Yeah, huge success. I mean, so what did he do? Did he do Rambo immediately after this? Was that, like, his next, uh, his his follow-up? Um, Rambo was 1979, I want to say. Uh, he did Paradise Alley, which he might have been doing at the same time as this. Um, and he did Rocky Two in 79. Nighthawks, which is um, a uh, a thing he did with um, like a like kind of a, a noir that he did with Rudger Hauer, um, which is actually better than people remember and kind of a straight up cop movie. Paradise Alley is considered a a, a bad movie, though I think. Right? Yes, yeah. yes, but it was it was high profile. Is uh, um, he did Victory, <laughs> and then he did Rocky Three, <laughs> and then he did First Blood. So really? he had done three Rocky movies before he did First Blood, which is amazing because he looks so young in First Blood too. Right. But he also did all these things in like five years. So, and then he did Staying Alive. He directed that. Directed Staying Alive. Yeah, yeah. but he was also a. a what is Staying movie. Alive? Is it so similar Sat to like Saturday Night Fever sequel? Oh yeah, okay. I was like, is it similar to like a Travolta type of thing? Yeah, so obviously, it's not very, nice. very, very similar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, what else have we got? Oh, we want to talk about the final fight? I want to talk about how he runs in Chucks. Oh, um, I had the same thought. Like, my arches hurt just watching him run, because they have no cushion in them. They Did are, they like, have running shoes back then? No, uh, probably not. I mean, professional basketball players played basketball in that, and every time I watch an old basketball game and they're playing in Chucks, I'm just like, how do you jump up in the air and land on those uh, things? They'll just kill you. It would just hurt. They're not great they athletic must have, shoes. They must have put, like, orthopedic... Uh, <laughs> insoles I, yeah in i guess there. they must have i mean Does I, exist was dr shoal even born yet <laughs> <laughs> i mean every, he was in medical school <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i'm just surprised that like everything he wears in this movie is so fashion like the gray I, sweatsuit yeah it's just covered way, in meat no the way <laughs> sweat <laughs> the way it's cut and egg yolk it's the way it's cut and the layers well, and the got, textures like yeah because he's got like the the sweat shirt over it yeah then with the cut off sleeves and i yeah. don't know like it's and the towel that's it's, wrapped around it's his like really like, styling to, and to the me little, the jaunty cock to his knit yeah, cap <laughs> right? well, what he's doing is like trying to make himself actually sweat more while he's working out because he's like oh. trying to like like 
It right. can his body down to only muscle. Colin. But yeah. I just feel like it's really, really fabulous. They make a lot of good decisions in terms of the look and feel of this movie. Um, yeah. Uh, and this is another scene where he's on the news punching the meat, and Duke is trying to get Apollo Creed's attention and be like, this guy's hitting the hell out of his meat. And Apollo's like, yeah, yeah, I'm counting my money. He's wearing his um, vest. He's talking about like uh, where the, the commercials are going to play. and all. He's like a marketing guy. Oh, so we, like, should we talk about the song at all? Oh my God! Let's the, let's do it. The Bill Conti. Uh, Bill Conti. It was actually going to be. <laughs> Why does Duke wear his shirt that way? <laughs> his half wide shirt. open. Yeah. I don't know, Colin. Maybe he's had a long day. He needs They're to let in his business chest meeting. <laughs> <laughs> he's not in the business meeting. I he's know. watching the TV. He's trying to unwind. <laughs> Sorry for the for the listeners. We're talking about the scene that's going on with the with Duke seeing the meat punching, and everyone else is wearing a suit, and Duke is wearing a suit shirt. But it's totally unbuttoned where his chest is exposed. And I just love like how <laughs> all the guys are like wearing, you know, less and that she wears, Adrian wears like triple, well, like quadruple layers, yeah. hats, coats, like, house coats. You never coats see her without up. like a full coat on. Or she <laughs> yeah. has a house coat over like another house coat yeah. with like a full <laughs> dike gown. But the guys are all like, you know, but un- in their shirts, they got the wife beaters on, they've got... It does you know. make you feel how cold it is, that you can see everyone's breath, and Talia Shire yeah. is always in 18 layers of clothing. Yeah, it's just like refreshing. It's just refreshing to it, it, see yeah, this the movie, male form and not the female form yeah. in a 70s movie. The realism in this, like, like you know, Colleen pointed out earlier, like, it just feels, the world feels lived in, it just feels real, and I just, I can't, yeah. you know, compare it to modern movies enough that Com- like compared to the rest of the rocky movies yeah. where the world yeah. of rocky increasingly becomes not the real world more cartoony yeah, yeah. 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 there's they robots very, by the end he yeah. solves the cold war in the fourth one yeah. <laughs> um, it's gonna be yeah i've never seen the other ones and i love this so much and i i, I probably like you're, guarantee yeah. i'm gonna hate them oh, I, I feel yeah. like you're a part of this journey now that you're gonna have yeah. to watch all of them. Uh, okay. you would be, you'll probably like them less and less although it is they do sort of continue the story it's just they have to f- throw new things in their path. I, and I, you know what, honestly, I forgot how supportive Adrian was in this because she becomes the wet blanket, the typical sports wife. <laughs> like there's a kind of oh a cliche. No. In, You're fighting again, Rock. <laughs> the, you, you can't win. Like that's literally her, her yes, words of support in, in, in the later you movies. Can't you win. can't win. Because she, she's worried about him. She thinks he's going to get himself hurt. And she thinks well, that she he, should be. He's he got, goes in the ring and he leads with his head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You lead with your head. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. So she becomes like less and less supportive, and more like the the person, the antagonist that he's got to overcome oh, to wow. achieve his dreams. But which like, is, wait, but wait, wait, wait. Your your spouse does that, and you've witnessed all of it, and you're like, like you would be I'm like, not, how is they, how are they alive? How are they alive? I'm not <laughs> saying that she, but I mean, in this movie, she asked him several times. I just don't understand why yeah. anybody would want to be a boxer. It's it's built into the character a little bit that she doesn't get. Yeah, she doesn't this. even want to yeah. watch, but she does want to support him, and and you know, her concern for him becomes like bigger the more the franchise goes on. It becomes more of a concern for him and his safety, and less about what he wants, um, or or what he needs to to prove himself. Um, Mm. But yeah, I was I was amazed in this one that she doesn't she has no interest in boxing, but she does care about him enough to support him, and it really like you know is all about you know she's a really good you know I mean person to have in his on his side in his corner. Mm-hmm. Uh, As the movies go on, they definitely choose a trajectory and they go down it, and like you know they commit to it. <laughs> but wait, you ha- let's go into history here. You, you said you have seen all the other Rocky movies. I've never seen them. You sure? You said you had Rocky two, three. I never, v, I never put v, them on. V, I. I never, yeah. I just remember seeing those. I, that's where I learned about Roman numerals. <laughs> that's where yeah. we all learned about. Yeah, them. That's, that's how we all learned. <laughs> that's why none of us can count past six in Roman numerals. <laughs> Actually, which I wanted to say one thing about the, the Romans. I feel like this whole movie. They is loved so, Rocky. <laughs> no, I feel like this is like one of those. Who fought the Romans again? Who fought the Romans? No, I mean Everyone, like, I think, no, like I mean like who, who's, yeah, a lot like, of people. who's like the most famous underdog against the Romans? Uh, oh, the Carthaginians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Carthians? Them. Okay, yeah. I feel like this is a little bit of like that. Like America's the Roman Empire, and Apollo Creed is kind of like so that he says, "I want to be the new emperor," or like they yeah. should. And I feel like this is about like the you know the the lower class people kind of uprising, and that there were those battles that were back that sometimes seemed so impossible, but by sheer anger and hurt and, and brute people won. 
Mm-hmm. You know, like and that's yeah, that's that's a, a des- yeah, desperation yeah. is what I wanted to say. Like, I think that's a big theme here. Scrappy, yeah. Just, no, yeah. it's like what pure tapping into like a pure, desperate, like guttural, like primal we, place. We get a hint of it in the first fight when he's like kind of getting beat up, and then like the guy breaks his nose or yeah. something, right? Yeah, and he gets goes into a rage and like pummels him. You know, he it's taps like, into something so deep. The guy cheats. He headbutts him. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh, that's what it is. He headbutts yeah. him. But yeah. like that, that sometimes like when you become when you're resting on your laurels and you're comfortable, and you know, like Apollo Creed. Now he's this guy who has all his money and fame. That that sometimes within that there's a little crack in the seam that you can take down the empire, yep. you know? And I think that's the theme. Yeah. His bit. hubris is it's like, the, it's just being like, not all he had to do. If, if Apollo Creed did pay attention and see that this guy was a contender, that he could, is someone who is going to be a worthy opponent, you know, maybe he could have gotten his act together and like, not looked like a fool getting, cause even though he wins, he wins by decision and he's like against a nobody against a nobody. And yeah. he gets his ass beat in front of everyone. And yep. to the point where the audience is cheering for Rocky. Not and for that's him. that in the Roman empire theme that I'm saying here is similar to the Hollywood theme of him being an actor because it's like Hollywood is this sort of like gilded Roman empire and people feel like, Oh, you sorry, you're not part of it. You can't make it. There's just no way if you're not already there, you're not there. And then sometimes somebody like Sylvester Stallone like gets through a crack because he's just so fed up. Yep. Yeah. 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 And it's, you know, that's the, I, uh, go ahead. Yeah. I, I also think it speaks really well to, um, uh, Carl Weathers' performance because you see him like go through all of this like mentally in the fight. in the ring. Yeah, the ring. yeah, that is like while he's fighting. Yeah, yeah, he really conveys a lot of the surprise, the realizing he underestimated this guy, that whole thing, and it's all kind of it, there having that on awareness. His face. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I love the shot at the end where like he knocks Rocky down. The, the eight count in like the 14th round or whatever, where he just completely kicks his ass the entire round, knocks him out. Rocky's flat on the canvas and he's jumping up with his hands in the air. And then Rocky stands up and just a look on Carl Weathers face, like says it all. It's like, just you like, gotta be fucking no, kidding. Yeah. Me. You know, yeah. Like, yeah. I love that. Like, part. I'm going to have to earn it. You know, like, yeah. and it's, he goes through this process. His character arc is flat for this entire movie it, of overconfidence. And then in the ring, he goes through this whole thing of, okay, I, if I want this, if I'm really the best fighter in the world, I have to prove it. I have to prove it. And then, yeah, that's that part when he knocks him down and Rocky gets back up. It's, it's, it, he knows he's hurting him too. Yeah. You know what I mean? He's like, I'm yeah. hurting this guy yeah, now. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. it's great. And I mean, he it, doesn't it, care. Yeah. It's, like, it, yeah. It's a great moment. It's a great um, culmination of um, yeah. what the movie has been building to the only movie in the franchise, by the way, I think, well, we never see his opponent train. Right. We never see oh. Apollo actually. There's always a training montage. Usually, we're seeing, we're watching right now. We're watching the Rocky training montage where he's getting hit with a medicine ball. He's doing his speed bag. He's doing his crunches. Usually, this is intercut with the other guy mm-hmm. using some other training technique. Yeah, <laughs> you're um, right. To do to you yeah. know do whatever, and that's the case in every other movie. But in this one, Apollo does not train at all because he doesn't think this, he needs this to. This is a joke. Yeah. This yeah. Is, this is this is a, a, show. a show. Yeah. yeah. Exhibition. Yep. Um, but for Rocky, this is life and death. Oh, here's, 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 a sprinting your, here's your scene. shot. Oh, my God. Yeah. It's so crazy. This also inspired the opening to um, uh, Mike Tyson's Mike punch Tyson's out. Mike Tyson's punch <laughs> out, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Definitely. I mean, yeah, this is unbelievable. I could just see, like, push start. Like, right like there. he's already going as like, fast as he can go. Keeps and yeah, going. He, then he go, just again, goes again, and again. I mean. Yeah. And we, we can't, we, we have the sound off, so we can't hear the song. But this is also the great moment of the score. It's like really just made Okay, by the way, guys, there is a shot at the end where they zoom in on Rocky. The original shot, the camera actually pulled back, and they just reversed it. So watch. I want you all to watch the shot that is in reverse. He punches backwards. He's jumping up and down backwards. Um, it's. I think it's the next shot here. This is the one. He's. This is him. Oh, this, this is all in reverse. Out. Watch him punch. Oh, oh yeah. Punch him oh. backwards. And oh. now he's doing a little Irish jig. <laughs> Whoa. Uh, pretty yeah. funny. He's punching backwards. That's crazy. But yeah, you never would have noticed that if you didn't say yeah. anything. Yeah. It's amazing how well it works. So um, they pulled back? Yeah, the original shot was pulling back. And, and they, they were wanted like. It to, and they just felt like it. you really wanted to get in with the character. Right. That's there. funny. Tempo magazine, not Time magazine. <laughs> Isn't there some story like he the name Italian the Italian Stallion comes from like when he first started out he would do like snuff films he did like por- pornographic. I think they actually called it uh, they call they called that movie he was in a movie called um, Party at Kitty and Party at something in Kitty's I'll look it up um, mm. Party at Kitty and Studs um, but it, they later after this came out 
they re-released that movie that came out in 1970 as the Italian as stallion. the Italian stallion because he you know did some hardcore boning in that. Um, so that that term Italian stallion came from this movie. Or was that something that people... I, th- I, I thought so. it was just a general term that people yeah, used. I think, I think, that's what I I think, think his last name in Italian, I think Stallone means stallion in Italian. Oh. So that might have been part of it. Yeah. Um, okay, but yeah, so that that's amazing. That's, that's. I mean, yeah, it definitely. He definitely made that term famous. If I mean, you might have called right. someone an Italian stallion. Yeah, that it just rhymes. sounds like somebody. Like, it rhymes, you know, like so yeah. you know, in World War Two, in the in the Jeep crew. Hey, that's mm. Gino. He's the Italian stallion over there. Right. You know. But, okay. Um, yeah. But yeah, this is definitely where it became famous. This is another improv line where he was supposed to wear red shorts with white stripe on them, and the costume department changed it. But they had already printed out the giant posters for the stadium. I love this. So part. he, so he was like, he just felt like it would be like in character for him to like complain about it. And the guy's like, it's not important. You know? Yeah, <laughs> right. No one's gonna notice that. Yeah, I, I love that. There's one thing that he says in here that I don't know if that was improv. Oh no, it's not. But the part where. In, he is talking about how it didn't bother him at all that they were making fun of him on TV. Yeah. And then he goes outside and he just says, you know what, Adrian, you know how I said it didn't bother me. It did. That is like the sweetest. Yeah. Part just of like the, movie. the vulnerability of him again, a surprise, like little, yeah. I cried at the end of this. She did. It's, I mean, it's an emotional, I was surprised how like even having seen it several times and knowing everything that happens and kind of there is a lot of moments in this where you're just like it gets you emotionally it is kind of intentionally a tearjerker um and yeah and that that lasts especially after the fight because the fight is so br- we, we should probably just jump in and talk about the fight yeah we're gonna be watching it here in a second it's about to start <laughs> but, uh, yeah it's so brutal but it's so well done first of all they are hitting each other sometimes which you know more often than i think they would nowadays um and Second, like, I guess they had really struggled with the choreography of the thing um, because they had, like, some fight choreographers come in and try to teach them the thing, and they gave up and fired the fight choreographers and had Stallone just say what the moves were. What the moves were because, it's you know, it's all kind of built up of, like, you know, Rocky's focusing on Apollo's body because that's the thing, you know, that's they want to use yeah. weak point. And, and Apollo's, you know, at first overconfident and dancing and showing off. And there was all this like thing of like, okay, well now he's going to throw his right and then he's going to duck this and now he's going to take a lot of shots to the face and he's going to be back in the ropes. So they, you know, basically wrote out what they scripted the fight in terms of how dramatically each round would play and what physically would have to happen to make that happen. And then they got in the ring and just practiced it over and over again. Mm -hmm. But it really works. You get the drama of what's, even if you don't know boxing, you still sort of understand like physically what's happening and who's hurt and who's, you know, struggling and why the best part of it for me was watching it with call. And like, uh, you know, he's all beat up at one point and he's, he's back in his corner and he's like, cut me, cut me. And Colleen's like, what does that mean? Cut me, cut me. And I'm like, uh, they're going to cut him. They're going to like, <laughs> yeah, they got to cut him to let the blood the out. Juice out. <laughs> yeah. And then all, right as I said that, it went <laughs> and the blood yeah. splurts out. And she's like, Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Get too swollen. They also get cauliflower ear. Mm. Oh yeah. Nasty business. Yeah. Here you um, go with one of your cauliflower schemes. <laughs> <laughs> cauliflower. I like the puppies behind her headboard there. <laughs> <laughs> Seems appropriate. Yeah, and they're in this squalid one bedroom that now is just two of them are living in there. Looks like a, a half twin bed cot. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> this is why he, we only see her sleeping in the bed. He's always getting up at night. Yeah. It's not to train. It's because they can only fit one of them in the bed at the time. They take turns. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but this is a nice scene where she's like kind of psyching him up. Um, yeah. Uh, I think the other thing that's interesting about the last fight is like sort of the, the way they, so they sort of just gloss over a lot of the middle rounds. You see the first two rounds you see like he, so Apollo goes into his, he's never even been knocked down before. So this is because they say when Rocky knocks him down, it's like, that's the first time the champs ever been like even, yeah knocked down affected that much yeah Yeah. and nobody's ever gone the distance with him and you know it's kind of amazing that like they start off with like apollo's dancing and toying with him and then he gets in like what could have been like a lucky shot and just knocks him on his ass and then it becomes kind of a real fight but then apollo kind of beats the shit out of him for the rest of that round but they always always have this ebb and flow of just when it seems like rocky's getting overwhelmed and apollo feels like he's got the upper hand you realize that no rocky can take a lot of punishment 
and he also gets in those body blows or lands a lucky punch and somehow, you know, keeps himself in it. They do sort of just go through those <laughs> middle rounds and you don't get any of the round three through 13. You really just don't see yeah. any of. Uh, both Colleen and I are boxing experts because she's like, how many rounds are in boxing? I'm like, 12. It's definitely 12. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's like the round fight. round 13. Yeah. Before, and I'm like, okay, I have no I, fucking... I, I do depends on the fight. I think now it might be 12 everywhere. Um, yeah, usually 12 the, rounds in my head is like a state... Like they that's a they thing. set the number of rounds before the fight for whichever fight it is. Oh, yeah, okay. but I, I think that the... At, I do think that a lot of the commissions won't allow a 15 round fight anymore. I'm yeah. not sure if they, I'm not sure if any do, but I think 12 is, is a lot of times the standard now. Um, but yeah, all this is great. The prep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, breathing in. What is that stuff? I think it's smelling salts. What does that do? No, it just opens up your smelling salts. I think that would be it like um, makes you extra alert. Whatever um, it is. No, like I think it's like, like some kind of, um, saline or something to uh to because you got all the blood vessels in your nose i think it's to like constrict those blood vessels so that, so that you don't get bloody gonna, noses yes, yeah, oh, okay. bleed all over the place all right okay so interesting, interesting. how it's all thought out and i love up their faces so the so yeah. punches can't land as oh yeah, that's yeah so the the gloves will slip a little bit yeah um i love her hat and he says yeah. it at the end. Where's your hat? Like, I <laughs> yeah, love like it. that's his biggest concern. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was red, and that's an easy yeah. color to remember. I love his meat company advertisement like, on the back. Honestly, he just he has that thing that Homer Simpson had, where he has like an extra layer of cushioning <laughs> yeah. around his brain or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I wonder if um, I wonder if when she loses her hat in the crowd running up to the stage, if that was scripted, because you can see when she fir- when it first falls off her head, she has this moment where she almost leans over to pick it up. And then she's like, okay, I don't really yeah, know. And again, he's like, we have to write it, that yeah, in. Like, we, we have to address sure. like where yeah. her hat went. Yeah, people, but I don't want the people leaving the theater to be like, where was her hat at the yeah, end? Was that, yeah. a was that a different girl? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Just recognize her without the hat. The only Adrian I know wears a red hat. <laughs> I love I love that the like that he um he got that sponsor and it makes his robe like way uglier. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. It's, I can't remember what he said. He's like, you know, uh Paulie gets five hundred bucks and three thousand, yeah, three, three thousand, <laughs> yeah. and then Mick and Mick's response is like, "Oh, that seems like a real good deal." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I was, I was again surprised. Like, I paused the movie. I saw that there was only like nine minutes left, and I know that a portion of that is credits. Yeah, right. So I was like, "How long is this fight scene?" And uh, it, it actually plays like a pretty good length. You know, like it doesn't feel too short or too long. It's like. You get the ebb and flow of it, like you yep. said. Yep. You know, it's enough. When, when I was young and I had the DVDs, I would just like watch just the just the, the fight fights. Scenes. Yeah, yeah, me too. Me too. <laughs> or if I saw that Rocky or two or three was on TV, I would like clock. Yeah. I'd be like, okay, I'm, I'll tune back into this in like an hour and a half. Yeah. <laughs> I used to oh, know oh, the they're talking about stuff again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I used to know the minutes of where I like wanted to start it, but you know. I didn't. I didn't keep that memorized, which I think is actually a good thing. Yeah. See, the, here's here's Apollo Creed coming out dressed as George Washington. <laughs> George Washington th- throwing money like this is so yeah. over the top. On a boat, like he's oh, crossing yeah. the Delaware. Yeah. He's <laughs> literally showboating. Yeah. Um, <laughs> on a boat. <laughs> on a boat. Yeah. Like the this tricorn is, hat. This is his hubris. Is that he just like it's all a show. He's made his money. He just like is all about making the money. Doesn't it, care about the sport, and it's kind of a preview for the, the Rocky Four beginning, where it's like yeah. living in America. <laughs> yeah, that's what yeah. I like really like the Uncle Sam hat and the fireworks are going off, and actual James Brown. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> God, we have so much to look forward to. <laughs> um, yeah, no, this is where I wish the movie's uh, budget was bigger because I, I really wanted to see them yeah. go for it. Oh, it's this. fun. Like you just saw right there how many empty seats there were in the top top row. Yeah. Like there's so many shots of you can see empty seats right there if you look. There's empty seats throughout this because they literally only yeah. had you know like a hundred people for extras so they had to shoot you know they had to like angle it towards like oh there's gonna be a crowd here for this little <laughs> shot crowd there for this little shot and you'll notice that every cutaway to the crowd cheering is clearly stock footage of <laughs> oh, oh it's coming yeah, up yeah, you'll yeah see yeah. that a lot yeah you're right look at all the empty seats but if you really look but you're not looking at that you're looking no. at him we're only looking now because it's on mute and we're told to look at it yeah. <laughs> pretty funny but yeah the budgets get bigger on these movies too so like it becomes more you know it becomes more of a thing lots of people this this is the most um like, I like how mickey's like laughing at apollo creed's antics yeah and they the, all are the, they know the stuff, he's a fool the stuff he's doing right there is the most uh, um 
like imitation of Muhammad Ali stuff. I think that, right. that Apollo Creed does. Like, yeah. Now we're just watching the movie. <laughs> <laughs> I, I this has a little. This is a little bit of a Ma- Magic Mike parallel. Oh, in, in that uh, in that this one is kind of like the indie character oh, driven. Here's the stock footage. Oh yeah, clearly stock footage. Oh yes. Um, the sort of indie character driven drama that really isn't about the thing that you think it's about. Right. And then the second one is very much the thing that you thought the first one was about. <laughs> oh, it's wow. about, it's yeah, about male strippers. Oh, okay. That is so, the only other franchise I watched with Matt. Oh, well, there you go. Well, that's, and we'll I agree. just bring you on for I, franchises that are indie dramas that turn into some different genre later on. They're doing a third Magic Mike, too, which we, I will, was just gonna which say we will have to cover. We will. We will. Um, all right. Tickets soon. I think it's time that we rate this thing. Yep. We're, uh, we're ready to put our two cents in about this great, great movie that we all seem to love. Yep. Oh, uh, by the way, that is Joe Frazier, of course, the yep. great yeah. Philly. Uh, so Joe apparently Frazier. they they wanted a bunch of former champs to come, and the only guy they could get was Joe Frazier. But then they were like, oh, he's a Philly guy, so that's perfect. That's That'll just play into this yeah. whole thing. Uh, he's like, oh, they must be friends. I like <laughs> it makes the movie more, I don't know, because Joe Frazier, I think, was maybe still boxing at the time. He, yeah, he had not. If he was retired, he hadn't been retired long. <laughs> and you, you never know with boxers because you know sometimes they retire and but then they end up fighting again. Playing it as he was the former champion, so this kind of like it takes it out of time a little bit. Yeah, like, a little but, bit. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah like what was the succession? Did yeah. Frazier lose to Apollo, Apollo Creed, Creed yeah. or did Frazier lose to Ali and then he lost to Apollo Creed or was it Foreman? I, <laughs> I think Muhammad Ali doesn't exist in this world. That would be my assumption yeah. that this is like Creed is like a, a you know, he's too separate. much of a parallel, yeah. even though I, I do think it's a, a, a different character. It's just, Oh, totally. Yeah. Um, all right. Who wants to go first? I'll go first. Um, <laughs> I'm glad we settled it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the master of disaster! I love. Oh, wait, we didn't figure out all of our boxing names. Oh, we got the Scotch egg, but we didn't. Figure oh, that was yeah. good. Yeah. Is it because you saw the master of disaster yeah. on screen? You <laughs> thought of Colin? <laughs> <laughs> no, my favorite one. My favorite one of Apollo Creed's nickname. My favorite one of his nicknames is um, the Count of Monte Fisto. <laughs> oh, <laughs> That's <wow>. just <laughs> so good. Yeah. What would um, your name be, um, Harris? Oh, I really should have thought of that. I feel like I it's it something up. about being tall. Yeah, probably. The mountain, like the, the, uh, mm, mm. nothing rhymes with Harris. <laughs> Collins can be Punderclap. Punderclap. Oh, you could be like the, what's the, what's the tallest tree? The Sherman? Yeah, the Sherman. The <laughs> Sherman. Eh. No. What's well, another tall thing? Like uh, the Empire State Building. <laughs> another tall thing that boxes like a giraffe. <laughs> <That> <laughs> the kangaroo. <laughs> the giraffe. The boxing giraffe. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Colleen, you got a fighting name? Um, the Scotch Egg's wife. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I don't know. I was like trying to think of something earlier, like the Sassy Lassie. Oh, oh that's the Sassy good. Lassie. That's good. I like it. Um, the call cauliflower ear. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> um, How about you, Colin? I don't know. Colin Nation is upset. Yeah. Uh, we should get, we should, um, we should request uh, suggestions. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. Know, right boxing in. Boxing names. Band submissions. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That, that'll be our Rocky Four. <laughs> yeah. We'll come back <laughs> at the end. We'll come up with some. I'm sure throughout these 18 movies, we'll come up with something. <laughs> All right. Oh, yeah. He, go what up, was that? A lucky punch right there? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Me. I'm talking. I'm reading this movie. Uh, I, I, you know, I love this movie. Uh, I hadn't seen it in a really long time, but watching it as an adult was a, was a great experience. Um, I like his performance, Stallone. Um, I really enjoy, uh, you know, this, all the sentimental moments, like the, the love story that's really underneath. I think as a kid, you know, that stuff kind of is boring and you just want to get to the fight. But I feel like now you look and you realize like the, the worth that it has and like that, 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 this isn't just like, a fight movie. It's really not even about that. It's about the underdog story and, and the love story. And it's great. And the music really like drives this movie. It's throughout. I love that you hear the theme like played melodically, like on a piano, like a little bit. And it kind of, you don't really hear the full thing. I mean, you hear it at the very beginning, but you don't hear the whole thing until really the montage scene, I think is when it all plays out. 
Um, and of course during the fight and they, they carry this out throughout the rest of the movies cause it's great. It's just great music. Um, yeah, I just, you know, I think this is a story for the ages. Uh, I mean, it just works. It's not terribly dated really at all. Uh, aside, aside for that one scene when he forces himself on her a little <laughs> bit, but we've seen that in sh- sh- like shades of that in James Bond movies and stuff. We're kind of used to that. It was a different time. It was the seventies, ladies and gentlemen. And he also tells her to go in and cook the meat at one point. He's like, <laughs> just go cook the meat. Damn it. Um, yeah, no, Mickey's great. Adrian's great. Her hat is great. Uh, I mean, this movie is solid. I mean, it's, it's a fucking classic. It won best picture. Like, what I wouldn't change a thing about this movie. I, I think it's uh uh you know a perfect ten. A perfect ten. Wow. Uh, I'll go. Okay. Um, I agree with everything Matt said. This is a great movie. Um, and I think it's really it's a great movie not because it's a great you know like it's always it always ranks pretty high in the list of the greatest sports movies. By the way, we're watching this final fight and. They're pulling their punches, but they're definitely making more contact than you would ever make nowadays making a movie. Like, they're hitting each other. Um, but uh, like This angle's not so good. No. Like, cut no, away from no. this. Like, cut away from this. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, this is always ranked as, like, one of the great sports movies, but very similar to Magic Mike. It's not what, a, what you think it's about. It's about these characters. It's very emotionally driven, and it's really a movie about, like, loneliness and self-worth. And it does that so well. It builds these characters so well. The screenplay is so, like, solid. And um, it, it looks great. We didn't really talk about the DP, but it's it's really well shot. Um, the grittiness of the atmosphere, it's, you know, sort of downtrodden losers in this, you know, kind of forgotten city that, uh, you know, are trying to figure out a way to make their dreams come true. And then you see it happen, and you get that, like, sort of, endorphin rush of vicariously appreciating somebody you know somebody having the the best day of their life you know um and mostly that the payoff is about the emotions uh not and not about the fight it's the rocky movie where the fight is probably the least important thing in it and um and it just ends perfectly, as we already said. So I'm I'm not going to repeat myself even more. This is a great movie. I've got no notes. Ten Timothy Dolphins. Wow. Can I go or? Uh, let's let's let our guest go. Okay. Paul, you ready to? No. Let's no. Go. All right. Let's let Colin go. All right. Well, I thought the movie is really good, and uh, you know, a lot of a lot of things have been said already. Uh, we've heard things said by Matt. We've heard things said by Harris. Um. Oh yeah. In terms of the summaries <laughs> uh, and, the, and oh. the ratings <laughs> no. so far, but also yes, we have heard things said by Colleen as well. Um. And I, I've said some things as well. And I, uh, I'm just gonna say that I would like to rate this movie with nine Timothy Dolphins. Colin, perfect score. <laughs> yeah, Colin will never give a ten. Mainly because he's a dick. <laughs> <laughs> Is your version of a perfect Rocky film one where Rocky fights you? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I think that's the, the fifth one, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, you know how the like the the movies are the Creed movies now? Like, I want. So what are we on? We did it's, it's Rocky one through six, and then two Creed movies. Yeah. Is there a third Soon Creed d- movie? It's coming. Okay. Later this year. So that's, we're at nine now. So like now after Creed three happens, then they should make Rocky X. Yes. X. Yes. Yes. You know, funny story. Yeah. There is a movie called Rocky X. It's a porno film and I've seen it. (laughs) 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 it. Uh, I'll just tell the story real quick. Sorry to interrupt your thing. But, uh, I used to be in a band back in the day and like we would hang out and our lead singer, uh, his name is Doyle. His, uh, we'd hang out in his garage, which was also like, I think where he slept. Um, <laughs> but, uh, one time, one time we were all hanging out, a bunch of guys drinking beers or whatever. And a buddy of his, whose name I don't remember, came in and he's like, guys, I got something great. We have got to see, this. we have to watch this right now. And he just goes over to Doyle's, um, 
TV, which had a, I don't remember if the VCR was built in. I feel like it might have been. <laughs> that, that makes it visually. Yes, I feel like yeah. everyone had that, right? Um, so he puts the tape in. It's called Rocky X. We watch it. It stars a, a porn star named John C. Holmes, who is famous for having a 13-inch penis. It's like That's pretty big. I now, <laughs> I got to tell you guys, like, a bunch of guys, I think there were some girls there, too, watching this thing. It there was no, like there were no girls there. No, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Guys, you got to just watch it. It was like it was frightening. This got <laughs> really, gotta. this got really weird at the end. Yeah, yeah. It was frightening. Like, I mean, like, me. guys, you have to get in a room full of men and watch pornography together. If you haven't tried it, man, you're no, missing out. You're painting the picture wrong. There were girls there. It was guys, girls. All you know, we all had the same reaction that like this guy. We were watching a human being who had who had a horse penis. It was just, it was just frightening guys. It was both wondrous and frightening and like just horrible. How did we get here? <laughs> <laughs> Our show always kind of gets here. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I digress. Uh, Colin continue. So, so Rocky X will be the last movie we cover in the franchise. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, Wait, I don't think I had more. It. Yeah. 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 No, we were talking about how, you are gonna. We're gonna do a Creed sequel, where it's a spinoff where you play one of Creed's <laughs> opponents, Angry Sons, who has to get trained by Adonis Creed. Which what was your name? P- Punderdome or like <laughs> Pund- Punderclap? <laughs> Punderclap. Call him Punderclap Shaw. Oh my god. Oh man. Um, yes. No. We're ready for Colleen to. All right. Um, yeah. So I would say this movie falls into a category of elite films that I call transcendent films where they hit me in an emotion that I didn't know I had or a place I needed to feel that I hadn't felt in a long time or scratch some sort of like unearth something from the past. So I, I would rank it with like La Strada, Florida Project, The Graduate in America, some of my favorites. And um, yeah, so I think this movie had everything. It was like, you know, red hot, hot bods. Um, I liked the fashion. I liked the red hat. I liked his his uh, style, and um, yeah, I liked the fight. It was great. The the gloves, the passion. So for me, I'm still only gonna give this film an eight. Uh, it, transcendent. Yet it's still, although it had all those elements, the smalt schmaltziness still just. I don't know. I can't put it up there with my top. If we're, I don't know. For me, a 10 is a, a really high number. And so I think there's a couple of things that just could have been a little even. Maybe it's not. I don't Maybe this movie couldn't have been any better version of itself. But there are other movies that are better movies. Does that make sense? It's a 10, mm-hmm. it's a 10 in its lane. Right. But it's uh, not okay, a yeah. 10 in my universe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Beautiful. Right as the movie ends. Look at that. Perfect timing. We nailed it. The gloves come off. All right. Now I want to say, Colleen, thank you for, for doing this long-awaited episode. I had a great time. Finally, maybe now you'll look at my work that I do on this podcast nope. in a different light. <laughs> 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 I now know what it is, and it will not change. Damn it. <laughs> will you listen to this episode? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think I'm very supportive in my own Adrian way you're you are really the adrian to his yeah I, I i you'll don't. never win <laughs> <laughs> you, you can't beat him <laughs> i just stand i don't watch the fight it just <laughs> are you are you afraid that matt being around us will give him brain damage <laughs> yes <laughs> i think that's entirely possible it might already be happening i feel like i've gotten dumber since we started doing this oh, podcast no. i don't know that it's i can blame you guys but oh. i don't think you're entirely innocent either <laughs> <laughs> at least colin for, yeah, for the definitely. love of god you had like, some brain cells to lose, Harris. I think it's, it's probably good. <laughs> good for you. Well, I feel like we all got way smarter and happier. <laughs> <laughs> this this show, you might say, gives us purpose. Well, it's like they say that you know you guys fill each other's gaps. Oh. Uh, <laughs> there's only one gap Gross. getting filled tonight. No, no, that's from the movie. That's yeah. cool. Okay, oh, good. Okay, okay good. I didn't know. Make oh, sure. Frank Stallone did this music. Oh, uh, he did. Yeah, he did some of the music. He actually cameoed. He was the one of the um, white doo-wop singers in the corner. Oh, my least favorite part. That's and, why I didn't get a ten. And he was also <laughs> the guy who stumbles out of the doorway when Adrian Wait. and Rocky are walking home from their date, and he's like, "Hey, you, the duck guy." The acapella group was 
your least favorite part, yet you had to include it in the two minute summary <laughs> because it's so Her disdain. For it, it. Yeah, <laughs> you made a classic two mi- minute summary mistake, which you would know if you ever heard us flounder through one. <laughs> is that you described like the setup of the movie for like a minute plus, <laughs> like the the first ten minutes of the movie were more than half of your summary time. Well, it was like I was like, this movie is perfect. Everything is perfect, and then that acapella group thing. I'm like, oh man, there's gonna be problems in this movie. <laughs> And I was really sad. Um, I just noticed that Frank Stallone played a character named Timekeeper, who, of course, is the, uh, much like in Loki, like (laughs) the time, he shows up from the future. (laughs) Yeah, to make sure that, like, everything goes according to life's plan. Well, did you see um, Butkus Stallone (laughs) was credited as dog? Yes. (laughs) But, the, but what doesn't make sense there is the dog had a name, and the name was Buttkiss. So it yeah. should have been Buttkiss Stallone as himself, or yes. Buttkiss Stallone as Absolutely. Buttkiss Balboa. Yes, true. I well, just be can't, weird. I can't say Buttkiss uh, often enough, though. Yeah. <laughs> what would be funny if his, you know, if uh, Rocky Balboa's dog was named Buttkiss Stallone. <laughs> 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 yeah. I just thought it was a good name. <laughs> I don't know. Just thought their last name just has a nice ring to it. Sounds like I think you got to give a dog a last name. You know, this episode didn't have enough Stallone impersonations. Yeah, I, think. I know. Oh, yeah. Well, just judging by that, I think that's <laughs> the reason is that hey, we're not very good at hey, it. Hey. 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 just going to talk out of say your mouth like this. Hey. Oh, yeah. Have you guys ever seen, or do you remember, like, I think it's one of the Hot Shots movies when... Charlie Sheen uh, like reenacts the scene from from Rocky and he he screams the girls I can't remember the girl's name from Hot Shots. Oh. It's like um uh, uh, God, I can't remember I can't it. Remember it Damn, it's so good too. Uh I'll I'll mention it in Rocky too. We'll nice. leave all this in cuz the fans need to know. They need yeah. to know. Uh Carl, do you uh have anything that you'd like to um plug while you're here? Anything anything hot, cool that you're working on? You got some stuff going on. What about what you mentioned to me earlier? Well, I'm getting texts about Maya not going to bed and my... Oh, your brain's mush now? Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, no. It's okay. Well, next time we should have Maya on the podcast. Yeah. You can take the night off. We'll be doing this long enough that she'll be old enough to finally be a guest one day. Wait, is she not old enough now? I think she might. <laughs> she might. If she, she watches probably the movie, be more yeah. compelling yeah. than some of our if, guests. Yeah, if we have her watch the movie, she would have what a lot to say. What's she talking about today? Uh, she has song tongue. What? Oh, yeah. She said she has song tongue. Song and we were like, they made it up. It's where you sing, and all of a sudden you're like, Mary had a little lamb. <laughs> <laughs> so she's just yelling. And then, yeah, you can't like, control what are you yelling you, about? She's yell. like, I've got song tongue. And then she goes, <laughs> it's a disease. <laughs> it's a disease. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Oh, boy. Yeah, she would be a pretty good podcast guest. I think she should have her out sometime. Oh, man. One of the racier movies. <laughs> All right, well, you so, you, so you're plugging on Maya. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much what I do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, so she's a little blonde girl. I, if you want to follow me on Instagram, I'm Maya's number one fan club. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great. All right. Well, cool. Well, thank you for doing this and for probably never doing this again. Or we'll have you back for like Rocky Six <laughs> to like close it out or something. I'll see you in another hundred episodes. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. All right, cool. All right, guys, you got any closing? Uh, closing. Oh, I think we should end with um, singing the song from this movie. Flying higher. <laughs> It helps to watch this part too. Maya would be really good at this. As always, thank you for listening. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe if you like the show. Thank you to our lovely guest, Colleen McGregor. And as always, thank you to Chris Morocco, a.k.a. C-Rock, for doing the Rocky remix for this series. We have a Patreon that you can check out and subscribe to for just $1 a month over at www.patreon.com L2W. Again, that's www.patreon.com L2W. Help support the podcast by joining. You get instant access to over 40 bonus shows that feature us covering non-franchise classics with a new episode every month. And again, that's www.patreon.com slash L2W. 
This show is a part of the Fandom Limb Podcast Network, so be sure to check out some of their other awesome shows, and be sure to tune in next time for Rocky 2. Rocky 2.